Hi, John. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So happy to be here. I'm very, very excited and a little bit nervous, I should say. Okay. <laughs> Are you standing up? Uh, no. <laughs> Okay. I just good. have camera like that. <laughs> okay. I thought you're gonna oh wow, you're gonna be standing up for the whole conversation. Um you're at that looks very sunny and Portuguese where you are. That's right. Yeah, I'm in Portugal right now. And um not like in Germany. In Germany I it would be everything monochromatic and grey behind me. So yeah, there is some sun here. What part of Portugal are you in? Um Near Lisbon, just like oh, 30 minutes okay. from Lisbon. So not far away from Lisbon. Okay, yeah, north, or, city. north or south of Lisbon? Ooh, I think a little bit down. So it's oh, okay. Uh, south. Yeah, I, I was in Porto. Um, my wife and I were in Porto. Oh, it's a good few years ago now. We were there for, I think it was like a week or whatever. Have you been down to Porto? Yeah, of course. Before yeah. we choose that place uh, for living, we actually, like me and my husband, we traveled around the Portugal and like stayed in every places and also in Porto. But it was too cold for me there. Like it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful, but too cold. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. And um, <laughs> where else? We were down in the Algarve for a while as well. My wife works in the golf industry, so we were down there playing golf. Um, can't remember. Oh, yeah. Where. Portimao. I love golf. <laughs> you like cool. golf? How is wet? Yeah, for sure. I like. I'm not a big professional in this, but I I love it. It's it gives me adrenaline. Like it's really exciting game. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. How is weather in your place? Uh, it's been a bit cold and rainy yesterday. Not so much rain today. Um, yeah, we haven't really had winter yet. <laughs> I think we might really? have missed it at this wow. stage. Yeah, there's been like one or two cold days. But then with the weather patterns changing, maybe in March, you know, we've, I've had that before where we've got snow in March. So, yeah, it's, it's not we're not through it yet. We're not through winter yet. But the days are, are not so. Yeah, like the evenings are getting longer. So that's beautiful. I, Find that yes, when, that's when it gets dark at four thirty in the in the afternoon. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I How agree. long are you in Portugal for? Are you there for the whole winter, or? Yeah, so we found uh, a little house here. So yeah, now we will spend here a winter for sure because in Germany it's just like impossible to survive there. It's too too um, not cold, but you know, like it's gray, everything, like all colors are going down and people are so sad there. Um, here you see smiles on people's face, they're singing, you know, like they're kind of happy and that yes. makes you also happy. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. but I will yeah. return here in summer for sure. Because, you know, return ocean. to, return, return, oh, return to uh, Portugal, okay, yeah. Porto yeah, um, yeah, for sure. If you're listening, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I nearly forgot. Oh, okay, I'm talking to Tanya Rivelis. Um Now, did I pronounce your surname right? Yes, absolutely. With English Brilliant. pronunciation, but it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Russian pronunciation? Uh, it's like more Rivelis, you know, like the Rivelis. R is, yeah, it's a little bit rough, like Rivelis. You know, like, Rivelis. Like a yeah. lion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> yeah um, i lived in australia for a good while and when i was looking at your name before i yeah, knew what it was my australian kind of came in and it was revilus <laughs> yeah tanya revilus <laughs> so weird but i didn't i didn't say that <laughs> I, I got it sort of right I've heard okay that. So I've, I've heard that version yeah <laughs> Um, okay, so you're in Portugal, but you normally live in Germany and you're from Russia originally. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> now, <Yeah. laughs> if you're listening, just to give you a time context for our conversation, today's Wednesday, the 9th of February, 2022. Um, now, for someone listening, uh, Tanya, who hasn't seen your paintings, how would you describe them? Um, 
Um, I would say they are uh, showing a lot of texture, a lot of bright colors. Um, I capture men in their sensual side and there are a lot of wonderful, deep, sad eyes. I would say it like that. <laughs> okay. Um, but not in the, I can't remember the name of that artist. You know, the lady artist in America who painted the big eyes, there was a movie made about her. Oh yeah. There was a movie with Crystal Wilde. Yeah. I, I remember yeah. Crystal Wilde, but <laughs> yeah. that, that lady, I think it's even called big eyes. Yeah. But they're not that kind yeah, of big eyes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. Now we've had lots of questions come yeah. in from social media, <laughs> all over social media. Um, we had a big Twitter component this time, which is um, not, not normal. But So uh, Egbert uh, Moderman, 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 let's say Egbert Moderman in the Netherlands That's said, great. I'd like to know what painters influenced your current work the most. Yeah, okay. I know Egbert and we actually m met and we exchanged oil paintings with him. He's living oh, not nice. far away from, uh, yeah, in Netherlands. And... Um, so, well, I would say uh, my biggest influence is uh, Ruprecht von Kaufmann. It's a German artist. Maybe you've heard yeah. about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's definitely like my favorite artist. And who else? Um, I think I, I always admired um, artists, Russian impressionists from early 20th century, like kind of um, Sirov, uh, Philip Malavin, Konstantin Provin. Um, I'm sorry that I was saying that with pure Russian accent, <laughs> but that's how you pronounce them. Yeah, so no, uh, who else? <laughs> um, Mikhail Vrubil. Um, and from non-Russian, non I would say Carlos Federico Saya. Uh, he's also one of my favorite. Uh, did you hear about him? No. How do you spell his last name? Uh, so it's S A E. Uh, Z, uh, Z is it? Because in my my mind it's like uh, Russian, English, German. So I'm sometimes it's such a mess. But it's S A E Z. Yeah. So Carlos Rodriguez. Federico. Frederico. Federico. See. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, Lucian Freud, of course, but. He uh, um, influenced so many artists, so just I wouldn't be surprised. Mm. Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, Repin and fashion, um, like a lot of, a lot of. You know, I'm not so long in art, so you know, I'm trying. I'm like a sponge. I'm trying to, you know, like get information and get inspiration from everywhere. Just collecting, collecting, collecting. All right. Um... <laughs> Carol Main in San Diego says, uh, who are the painters who influenced your choice to focus on the figure? Thanks. Your talent and determination is stunning. Thank you so much. Um, can I reply again with Ruprecht von Kaufmann? Yeah. Can you please tell him I was talking about him a lot? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, he's, he's really a regular, regular listener. He's always pestering me with the emails. Really? So yeah, I'll let him know. No. Wow. <laughs> no, damn it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Delete that part. <laughs> uh, so he was the main one who influenced you to go into, to, to focus on figures, yeah? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I would say. But uh, there are like a lot of artists, but I don't know why, but he's kind of um, the biggest influence. Uh, in my art journey, I would say. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> and are all your creative heroes artists or painters, you know? Um, yeah, I love Kafka. <laughs> um, I think from, from Kafka's book, I have that melancholical, you know, beautiful sadness in my paintings, maybe. Yeah, right. So, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe Kafka is also like a big influence in my art. Yeah, I remember seeing a documentary about him one time. You probably know this if you like him, but they were showing his original manuscripts and they sort of opened the book 
and then they sort of folded a page down that was inside and then it folded out again and it's this big huge thing it was before word processors but he was kind of writing as if he had a word processor so he would stick it down and you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah he was complicated person like <laughs> with a lot of like like a diamond with a lot of ages um and yeah, very facets, deep yeah. deep yeah, soul yeah. yeah 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 his letter to the young boy is Milena. have you read that yeah that's uh yeah it's actually funny but um just yesterday i sold my nft series that called uh letters to milena and yeah that was based actually and inspired by kafka's letters to milena book yeah so oh, nice. it's a big inspiration yeah oh, good <laughs> yeah. um medici vault on twitter that's their name says what inspired <laughs> you to start painting <laughs> Oof, um, I think here should I uh, should I tell here like a backstory how I actually started painting? Does it relate it to the question? Well, look, Tanya, it's kind of obvious from your paintings that you you know you spent years in school in Russian. You know, you've had a big Russian uh, you know study behind you, and you've been in a couple of ateliers. That, that's pretty much it, isn't it? No, actually, it's just opposite of it. <laughs> but if you if you yeah. think like so that, let's generally that's we just pause compliment. for a minute now. If you if you've looked at Tanya's paintings, prepare to feel slightly ill. Okay, <laughs> I'll explain why, why in a minute. All right, go ahead. <laughs> when you when you find out her where uh, her training and how long she's been painting. <laughs> Oh God. Okay. So um, I started painting around when I was 27 and I moved to Germany. So I started, like I was in Moscow, uh, had my art uh, history and graphic design uh, in university. And then I moved to Germany. That's like a long story short. Yeah. So I moved to Germany to learn uh, German language. Um, what is actually unusual a bit, but Anyway, I moved to Germany and there I had that um, the reason changed in my life because Moscow is such a hectic, chaotic city where you just don't have time even to, you know, to breathe. And then I moved to quiet, um, relaxed Germany. And then I had that time and that feeling that I want to express something. And actually, it was always inside me since I was like studying um, art history and I always admired all artists and like um, art itself. So I moved to Germany and then I bought oils, I bought brushes and I did my first oil painting from my sister. And it took me like a couple of weeks with a tiny, tiny brush. I was really afraid to do every brush stroke. But yeah, then I was, um, I understood that it's interesting for me. And then I start uh, having some workshop with uh, artists like Robert Liberace. I think you might know him and mm -hmm. um, Cesar Santos, David Gray, just a couple of weeks. And then I had a workshop, five days private workshop with Ivan Loginov. Um, He's also like very popular on Instagram uh, in St. Petersburg in the Repins Academy. And I should say that these five days just changed my art um, life or how you would say, like it just changed my mind completely because he showed me how to do that expressive brush stroke, how not to be afraid to paint with a uh, big brush, with open colors, you know? And then I was invited in small group show in little church in Netherlands. And there I was seen by two owners of one gallery. And then another gallery saw me. And then Arcadia um, in New York, Arcadia Contemporary Gallery, uh, invited me to take part in their grand opening in New York and then LA Art Show. So that was like... A, how you say when snowball is falling and it's just you know yeah. like getting bigger it's snowballed and bigger. Yeah. 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 yeah 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 yep um you better say the so. name of that um person that you went to the guy in um st petersburg 
Yeah, Ivan Loginov, he's a good friend of mine uh, and he's a teacher in uh, Japan's Academy right now. And he's an amazing teacher and amazing artist. And yeah, he, I've learned so many things from him, even in five days of workshop, what is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's it. <laughs> so what inspired you to start painting? All right. Yeah, that was a question. <laughs> I forgot that. Okay. What inspired? So I actually, I was always connected to art somehow. I had that feeling that something inside me was, you know, like wanted art somehow. Like I was um, in university, I chose that uh, faculty of art history as my um, extra faculty. You can choose like the second one. And yeah, I just had a feeling that I want to express myself all my life, but I didn't know how. And then in Germany, I just had um time and i had um um i don't know maybe inspiration and finally i could just stop you know not running to work and back home and just you know like look inside me and see what i what i really want yeah, yeah. so i think it's funny but germany inspired me <laughs> <laughs> yeah something like that yeah okay so um how long ago was that that you started? Do you mean, yeah, with, so with um, uh, for eight years. So I started eight years ago. Eight years ago. And you yeah. hadn't painted before and you weren't the sort of drawing kind of person. You weren't really, like, from what I understand, you didn't really start doing art until then, like eight years ago. Yeah, so I'm like normal kid. I was drawing some dolls, uh, you know, like on books or um, like sketches. But that was yeah. like usual for people, for, for, for teenagers, you know, like, um, yeah. But I never, I never did that portraits, for example. Um, and in university, I was working too early. Like on my second year, I was already working for my university as a designer. So actually everything was around computer. I was on computer all the time. Yeah, so oils, yeah. I started here, yeah, yeah. Okay, Robbie on Twitter says, your first painting, what was it? Oh, yeah, as I said, my, my sister's portrait and she hates me for it because she had to sit like two weeks and <laughs> yeah, she was not happy about that. <laughs> and I also, I was so inspired by uh, Dutch painters. So I put some weird red shawl on her head. <laughs> so, yeah, she, it was like, yeah, ridiculous, but, but beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Lawrence Fuller on Twitter says, how do you choose your subjects? Mm, uh, I might say that I choose people that I paint uh, from the crowd mostly it's a little bit um, maybe like weird but I stare at people in the crowd and then I just observe and then I see one person that catch my eye and uh, I feel like life is pressing a pause button and I see this person for a second in um like no movements, nothing, just this person and light around this person. So something like this, it's just maybe um, even not a second, but I just catch this moment. And then I just go straight to this person. And with my Russian accent, I start asking this person to make some photos of this person. So um, usually people agree, but some people run away, I should say. Like, <laughs> I don't know why, what scares them in me or in my voice, but they run away, yeah. <laughs> there was uh, some <laughs> something like that before yeah but i i try to show my instagram so they can yeah. see that i'm not a liar or something i don't want to bring them my home and i don't know <laughs> sell them drugs or something like that. do you and you take the photos of them there and then wherever they are on the street yeah, sometimes they agree to come or meet me somewhere else and make photos. If not, I just, actually, I just need a face, you know, in different uh, position and maybe hands. 
and then my imagination uh play around and just i make composition in my head yeah are you yeah. normally um the sort of person who finds it easy to go up to total strangers and start talking to them yeah that's how uh, i am okay <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I was shy before, but then I just like, how, how can I find, especially in Germany, you know how difficult it is to find uh, a model in Germany? Um, I don't. Like nobody wants to come to your home and pose for you. So like, everyone afraid, nobody trusts each other. Oh, okay. <laughs> joking, no, just joking. Um. So is that how the idea for a painting starts for you? Because some of your paintings have more than one person in them. Um, you know, you, do you get ideas and then sketch them down or does it all come from that moment, that slow motion moment where the person is lit up in light on the street? It sounds like there's almost like harp music playing <laughs> when that happens. Yeah. Yeah, sounds too, it sounds too poetic maybe. Um Okay, maybe maybe not all the time. Sometimes it's just uh, a book can inspire me. You know, like a scene in book I'm reading and I imagine how it looks like and like how it would look like uh, on painting. Sometimes it's music. Sometimes it's light falling down on my sister's eyelashes. You know, like a li like small details actually can bring me into uh, like idea what to paint. And also I love um, Instagram, of course. That's also a huge inspiration of Pinterest. Um, yeah, there you can also see like some reference that will uh, take you to some idea, um, maybe some poses too. Yeah, so not so poetic how I talked before, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a normal person. <laughs> And when, like, do you, do you make sketches, little, like little thumbnails, or do you write things down for, for the idea, for the very beginning of a painting, or is it all just visual? I do a lot of photos with my phone, for sure. Um, like, if you scroll my phone photos, it will be just a weird uh, photos of, I don't know, like, a tree, a bird, you know, like weird, weird photos. And yeah, that's how I collect my ideas. I just make photos of every scene and I forget sometimes to watch them after, you know, like to look what I made photos of. So I have like thousands of photos there. Yeah, but that's how my brain, I think how my brain catch the pictures and yes. that's how I collect them. Yeah. So. Do you work mostly from photos or do you have the people actually sit for you or a bit of both? Okay, I can tell here a little secret. I was listening to your podcast since I'm listening for like years and all my favorite artists on your podcast. And I was always shy to say that I'm painting from photos. And then it happened until I have heard podcast with Colin Berry and she said she's painting from photos. And I was like, oh, if she's painting from photos, I can <laughs> totally do that. She's great. And yeah, after that, I'm not shy to say that I'm also painting from photos. I have my iPad uh, Pro, the big one, where I can zoom like all the details. And yeah, it's very useful too. And yeah, I'm painting mostly from photos. I, I do paint from uh, like live um, when I'm going to some like workshop or when I'm in St. Petersburg and there I can get a model for not uh, so much money like in Germany. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, by the way, uh, oops, sorry, can I ask no. you too, because your art, like, do you paint from models? Because your art looks like uh, so much about imagination and some dreams. Like, it's so interesting. I was always, well, I, I wanted always to ask you, like, how do you paint? from yeah from photos well i i photos. sort of it depends on what i'm doing um but if i'm trying to paint a painting that's in my head and i want to get it out i'll make it on photoshop or i'll get pretty close to it on photoshop first and then that's my main kind of reference and that's okay. all from photos or just different things that i'll find combination of photos i take and, and combination uh, sorry of photos i find on the internet 
Um, now I'm kind of painting in this more exploration kind of style. I still use a photo as a, it's more like an ignition, sort of it, it ignites something inside me and that's the beginning of it. The, the end result doesn't look like the photo at all, but the, I need the photo to, to help yeah. me stay connected to what it was in that inspired me to take the photo in the first place. So something, you know, there was something aesthetic in it that, that made me want to take the photo, you know? Yeah. I've noticed actually so many artists nowadays trying to learn Photoshop because it's actually such a useful tool for oh, yeah. artists. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I use it also a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carol Don't tell Mayne. anyone. <laughs> well, you've just told everybody. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I reckon any tool is fine, you know? Yeah. Why not? Yeah, totally. If it helps. <laughs> uh, Carol Main in San Diego says, did you paint your recent art from live models or photo shoots? Kind of answered that already, but if there's anything you want to add to that. I, I do invite people sometimes and do a lot of photos like any artist do just like hundreds of photos and then just combine them in Photoshop. Yeah. Just yeah. pretty s simple boring <laughs> uh okay jody weitzman on instagram says would you speak about who these people in your paintings are and then vicky sullivan on patreon thanks for the tea vicky says hi tanya great paintings i was wondering how you find your models and costumes so you've talked about the models um already but anything <coughs> about costumes oh yeah okay um i love fashion and um following so many uh, fashion accounts on Instagram. That's where I get that ideas of prints on clothes or color combinations on clothes. So yeah, I think fashion helps me a lot. Um, and also um, I love stripes on clothes. You might notice that, um, but it's also all come from fashion, uh, just checking like, um, that Kupka's dog, the painting where a man sitting in yellow um, mm. jacket with blue stripe with black dog, that was actually idea came from Gucci collection. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I stole that from Gucci. <laughs> yeah, that jacket looks like it's in two paintings. There's another one of another man that's wearing a jacket similar, similar colors anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, it was inspired by Cook uh, uh, portrait, uh, yellow portrait. So oh, yeah, uh, yeah. that might be uh, something like similar, but that was inspired by Kupka. So yeah, that's why I called that Kupka's dog because it's dog sitting <laughs> is uh, from Kupka's dog, something like that. <laughs> so do you uh, do the costumes from your imagination or do you go and get reference or do you actually go and get the physical costumes? No, just from my imagination or from some collections that I see on Instagram or Pinterest. Just a color combination or maybe some prints. Um, yeah, but I just combine them in my head. And, and actually, it's so funny, but during the painting, I never know what colors is going to be, uh, like what, what colors of clothes is going to be. It's just happening. I'm just painting and then I don't know why, but in my brain, blue color appears and i think oh yeah blue color is okay here something like that it's all spontaneous everything's spontaneous i'm a drama uh, queen oh okay <laughs> <laughs> um violet jones on twitter says it's very common for fine artists to use the same models how did you come to choose yours and why are you drawn to more uh, sorry, and why are you drawn more to male models? Yeah, I can explain that. Although I'm married, <laughs> I don't have problems with my marriage. <laughs> um, so I already told that I'm choosing models usually like from the crowd or maybe I have inspiration uh, from the crowd. But why I paint men mostly? Um, I think it it's because of their faces. I mean, like I tried to paint women, like women too, but um, men has such a sculptural face. It has ages um, and, you know, like it has form and I can build that form with my brush strokes. 
so kind of sculpture but with oils does it make sense yep <laughs> yeah okay and um i also like noticed that people paint a women a lot and men not so often and if they paint men they're more like brutal macho kind of man right like a strong and i wanted to capture that sensual side of men like sad eyes that man has feelings to you know like that you know like friendship between men um yeah something like that so that's why i i love to paint men yeah okay yeah great okay <laughs> <Lovely>. <laughs> I hope I answer all the questions because you know, like you tell me if I should say more, like show me somehow. <laughs> Tanya, oh yeah, more. no, I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so it doesn't sound like you do a color study before you start. No, no, just all spontaneous, really. Um I know I'm I'm guilty, not like uh like normal good artists should do. Um but that's how my brain works. I'm just too spontaneous to plan that before. I can plan a composition a bit. I can plan uh, a pose a little bit. But I can't plan, for example, colors. I just start painting and it goes, you know, like step by step. And light shows me what to do. Music shows me what to do. Mood, you know, weather. Everything, like, just yeah. helps me to paint. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you get the reference photo or the idea? How do you get that onto the canvas? Like, do you paint, uh, do you draw in paint or do you, you know, the drawing stage? How does that bit go for you? You mean like how I already start my painting on the canvas, yes. right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I'm not painting on canvas. Uh, I'm doing that on plywood. The, yeah, does, the, does it call plywood on in english like always be pressed pressed wood I don't know. yeah but yeah i think the the stuff you're talking about though it's like the stuff in the roof there behind you is it that <laughs> yes my inspiration <laughs> yeah which is a you kind know, like, of I, yeah yeah if you're listening it's it's almost <laughs> like industrial chipboard um so it's not it, it's it's the it's the sort of chipboard you see in um if they're uh, closing off a site for a building or something like that, it's the, it's rough grained, it's uh, rough particles. It's not like very close particles. It's not like MDF or anything like that. So you see the bits of wood in it. And um, that's, I'm not sure, like it's got different names in different parts, parts of the world. So that's why I thought it'd be better to just kind of describe it. Um, that's so that's right. what you yeah. paint on. Yeah. Well, yes. how did you come to end up painting on that? Because it seems like it's very much part of, your process now that's true yes it's actually how i found my my uh, art language or art voice um, i think it all started when i was in um where their shop or like the shop where you buy things to build the house how you call that hardware store yeah Yes, hardware store. And there I saw that surface and it was not expensive and it was, you know, looking at me, I was looking at it and we had <laughs> connection. <laughs> and then I just thought that, well, it's a nice surface to paint. Why, why uh, shouldn't I try that? And I took it home. Uh, I did like a couple of experiments uh, with surface and how um, colors are um, like, how do I apply colors on it? And then I tried with uh, several um, medium to cover the wood uh, board, you know, so the um, connection between oil and board would be like strong. Yes. Um, yes. So, yeah, so that's how it happened. And I tried once. Oh, and actually the funny story that when I tried my first portrait on such board, I posted on Instagram and then just after a couple of hours, I think I got message from a gallery uh, that uh, I like your works, you know, like, and I saw, oh, it's a sign. <laughs> I should continue. <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> and now I just paint on these boards with such a pleasure because this surfaces, um, you, you know, like you never know what will be at the end because surface plays huge role 
uh, how like brush strokes will go, how it will be after colors will dry. So yeah, yeah. it's all that so what did you spontaneous arrive at? thing. What did you arrive at for your primer then for it so that it would take the paint? Um, so I use that gesso, I think that's yeah. how you call it. Yeah, so it's actually simple primer. I just sand the wood board a bit because it has um, something above it. And someone told me that it's uh, not good for connection between board and oil. So I sand it a little bit with sandpaper, right? Is it yep. uh, the name for paper? Yeah, and then I cover it a few times with gesso, with primer. Um, yeah, and then I give it sometimes color, so under like kind of under color, so a base color for my painting. Yeah. And then I paint with oils. How thick is it? The board. the wood board. Yes. Um, from nine millimeters to one and a half centimeter, something like that. Just depending on how big it is, is it? Yeah, because if it's big and then it's uh, like thick, right? Uh, then yes. it's heavy, uh, yeah. and then not any wall would, you know, like <laughs> be able to hang that. Okay, so the bigger it is, the thinner the board, and then you have a frame or something behind it. Then do you? Yeah, yeah, of course, a frame, and yeah, like like usual painting. Then I yeah. just work with it, like if it would be a canvas or something. Yeah. Do you make those panels yourself? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm already like, you know, everyday client in my uh, shop in Germany and people know when I'm coming, I'm coming for boards and I need them to be cut in particular <laughs> size and shape. So <laughs> okay. they know me already. <laughs> so when you um, have done all the priming and everything's ready, do you look at the board and, you know, you're thinking about the painting, you're going to paint on it and do you kind of, no, I think it, you know, rotate the can, rotate the board. Yeah, I think the way the the grain is going, the pieces of wood, the way you know, does do you do that or do you just start? No, I I, I really choose the side first of all because it's usually I've noticed it usually has two sides: one with smaller uh, particles and another one with bigger shapes of wood. So I take that one with the bigger shapes because then it's easier to work with and yeah. there are less holes inside um yeah. yeah so so i definitely use with a bigger uh texture okay so then going back to the drawing bit yeah so the drawing yeah i just i just um have a little uh kind of on my ipad i do some like in my photoshop i combine uh photos right and then uh in procreate in that program in ipad i just uh, make a silhouette or something like just main lines of that figure um yeah and then i i do it with brush uh already on the board so i just like try to transfer that uh silhouette uh on the board and then i just paint the details uh myself like from looking on ipad Okay, so it's all by Does, eye. You don't do grids or anything like that or tracing. Sometimes I do projectors. grids when it's, yeah, I do grids when it's um, commission and the face should be, uh, you know, like exactly how it should be. And I don't have that, you know, freedom in yeah. changing the face. Yeah, then I do grids. I love that grids. So what way do you paint? Like, do you, do you paint in layers or are you more kind of a la prima? Do you do a grisaille or, yeah, how does it go? I love to paint with uh, like one session. If the portrait is small or the painting is small, I try to finish it in one session, like a la prima. Uh, and then it looks like fresh to me and not so, you know, like tired, exhausted painting when you try to overpaint and overpaint again and again. But if the painting is big, then I try to... Um, paint with forms for example, or like parts of the painting. So I finished the face first, but I never leave like the face unfinished a bit. So the face should be finished. Then it will be, it will look fresh to me. And then for example, next day I do hands and the next day I do like clothes and something like that. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, Carol Main uh, in San Diego again. How, how did you develop your color theory? And then 007 Shank on Twitter says, very easy to spot your artwork by looking at colors. How did you how do you choose them to make it look so beautiful? And Maria Lupan Luplanes in um, New Jersey says, hi John. My question, or I suppose not a question, but can uh, she talk about her color palette, most especially her recent works? She makes use of these bright colors, and I'd love to know what inspires her colored palette. How does she choose colors? So uh, those three questions are all, yeah, all around the color. Okay, um, I can start with color palette. What, what I usually, because it's not all the time uh, the same, but usually I use that color. Should, should I just uh, call them like yep. what I have on my palette? Yep. Okay, so I have a pretty um, simple color palette. So it's titanium white, lemon yellow, yellow ochre, Indian yellow, I love a lot for, for like uh, warm shadows um, combined with violet maybe. And cadmium red, um, uh, and then oh, it's all it's all Nevsky Palitra colors I'm talking about because I've noticed that pigments are different usually. Like I try to uh, compare two pa paints from different brands and they were a little bit different. So I'm talking about Nevsky Palitra, that's what I'm using. Um, then uh, Mother just, Lake Just Red. say that brand name again, slow, slower. Yeah. <laughs> I think Denis Sarajan was talking about that brand too. He's using it a lot. And I yeah. think he's kind of ambassador of Nevsky Palitra. Uh, okay. Is, is that a Russian yeah. brand? Yeah, it's a Russian brand. It's very like old and all St. Petersburg Academy using that brand, I think. Yeah. Oh, and I'm okay. ordering that from St. Petersburg and my friends sending me like to Europe uh, boxes uh, of, of oils. Uh, yeah. Right. So... Yeah, and I don't know why, but colors are very like rich, maybe a lot of pigments inside. And right. I just really love like um, the color range. Uh, so I stopped on Meadow Lake Red Peppermint, that two of my favorite Meadow Lake Red and Mother or Meadow, Meadow Lake, I think Meadow, Mother, M A D D E R. Meadow, yeah, Meadow. Meadow. That's how they call them. I don't know. I have no idea what this means. So um, Meadow Lake Rose, then Violet, I use from Vincent and Newton because it's super rich and super dark. That's what I love. And uh, Mars Orange Transparent. This is also like a color that I use a lot. Um, Took is greenish. That's the color you see on background all the time. <laughs> That's color I can't live without. Um, and I've noticed that Portugal has this color in the sky, actually, and that inspires me more to use that color. Um, and Portuguese sky. Oh, yeah, like right, it's yeah. So, so bright blue and blue, just reminds yeah, me of yeah. that color all the time. Uh, ultramarine blue. And from green, I use a lot in shadows chromium oxid green. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And I have a couple of weird colors, Chinese colors, very, very bright. Uh, peach red from the brand Phoenix. That's a very bright color, almost uh, like shining, <laughs> you know, like yeah. very bright rose color. And Vincent red from Vincent Newton. I think that's it. I don't use black. Um, instead of black, I use Van Dyke brown. Um, and violet pincer. Yeah, that's that's pretty it. All right, very good. Yeah. Um, so how did you develop your color theory? Um, I don't know if I have one. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just re-asking Carol's question. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah, I mean, they're they're kind of asking about your color palette, but then they're also asking like how you kind of arrive at choosing the colors, which they are kind of saying are very you know unique to you. They're, they're, you know, one of one of the people was saying your your paintings are easy to spot because of your colors. Like, how is the how do you, how's your color choice? 
How does that work? I think I use a lot of open colors. Like I don't mix them like that. Uh, Turkish greenish, for example. Um, I just use it without mixing with anything. I try to mix like maximum two colors together so it doesn't look dirty. Um, right. Yeah, and maybe that's why like colors look a little bit fresh and bright. Uh, what else? Um, I don't know, it just happens. <laughs> it's just like, you know, like intuitively, is it the word for this? Yeah, like you do it by your yeah. heart? Yeah. yeah, so just just happens. I just love bright colors, I think. And that maybe happened because Germany is not so bright and I wanted to see something bright around me. <laughs> so I used that bright color. Yeah, yeah. 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 So do you do a lot of blending on the canvas itself or do you more optically blend, you know, meaning you put the two colors together and then you let the eye kind of do it? Yeah. So uh, I should say, because I don't have that art education, I always try. I always do that, you know, test on my palette. And like I, I mix two colors and they look good. And then if it's really good, I try to remember that and uh, painting a little uh, square on my easel. So my easel from the side looks in, you know, it just in so many squares of colors because that's how I try to remember the color, like combination of color. And then with, um, uh, with pencil, I just write letters or first letters of uh, color I used. So next time I can remember that combination, yeah, kind of, you know, my, my cheating easel, <laughs> is it I just invented that. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, you put those on your easel or on your palette? No, on my easel. Like if oh, okay. the color combination is so good and you know, like I, I really like it and I want to use it after, for example, in shadow some somewhere, I just yeah. put that square on easel. So I remember oh, yeah. that. That's not cheating. Yeah. I've heard loads of artists doing something similar. Yeah, yeah. You see, like yeah. that's good. Good to to know. Yeah. I'm not that bad. <laughs> yeah, like I know some artists, and they'll spend a lot of time, um, you know, like days making gradient sheets. You know, so they'll take a color and then they'll add white into it, and they'll yeah. have all these long kind of thin gradients of the different colors so they build up this whole reference of colors in fact there's a whole color system um where they you know they know exactly they can they can talk to each other who was it uh, natalie featherston she's she's done it i can't remember the name of the system um but they if 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 you study this system you can just sort of say oh yes i used a bit of blue blah 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 with uh mm -hmm green 46 and the other person will know exactly yeah. the color you're talking about because it's all been measured out you know so you're just doing a version of something similar yeah i did that sort of palette uh i think aaron westenberg or westenberg um he was uh having that sort of palette videos and yeah i tried to do that so um yeah, but didn't help me much. <laughs> Maybe because my memory is short, as we noticed that. <laughs> um, okay, Alina Karn on Instagram says, the color blue is intense and dominant in most of your works. Why is that? Um, Maybe because I love blue color. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that's what I was missing all the time. Maybe. I, I just, I can just think about it i can guess that that's what i was missing in germany like you know when i moved there because sky is normally a gray color it's a gray color very yeah. monochromatic it, gray color. what part of russia are you from originally moscow moscow oh that's right yeah yeah and is the sky different there like because i imagine the gray sky like when i think of gray skies i think of cities like it's just a city thing uh, because you, yeah. there's nothing, you know, you're seeing a gray sky against a gray building. It seems like everything's gray. Um, there's no nature to break it up or to put the put the sky in context. There's no natural context. Yeah, and polluted. Yeah. So was Moscow different or was it gray as well? 
Now it was also gray, of course, because of pollution. Uh, but I think I have that sweet memories from my childhood because I was living with my grandma in some village far oh, away okay. from big cities. And I think that that it was like Soviet Union, but that was territory of Ukraine, uh, okay. like cu currently. And I remember that sky was just so beautiful and so blue. And I think that right. that memories bring me to blue color. Ah, nice. Yeah, that's lovely. So poetic. I'm so poetic. <laughs> yeah, it's just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Kim Power in New York says, I love painters who use really thick paint and you do it beautifully. Are you using any kind of medium with your paint? Gorgeous work. Thank you so much. Yes, I use uh, some mediums like um, for a couple of years I opened, uh, I invented, no, I like, I found, I, I would say, I found uh, Sanilier's uh, green oil collection something like that. So it's like non-toxic uh, mediums and um, like they have Sina, they have gels, but they are non-toxic and you can even take it to plane. There is a sign there. So um, first of all, take my-, on, my an that, yeah, on, on an airplane. Yeah, on an airplane. Yeah, that's yeah. what I wanted. And um, because my studio in Germany is pretty small, it's just like, I don't know, three meters um three quadrat uh, meters and like i usually close the door so it's better if i will breathe with something non-toxical otherwise i will just die soon you know like <laughs> so yeah. i i, I that will be pretty poetic and I want... <laughs> yeah that... <laughs> you see i love kafka yeah you can feel it right <laughs> yeah she yeah so um <laughs> <laughs> and left her letters and she said to burn them but they didn't and they made a book of it yeah. um yes yeah. so uh I, I i love to use that non-toxic materials like and i found that sanilier uh, medium gel that helps me to make my oils like more uh thinner and not to use them a lot because you know like oils are expensive and since I'm um, ordering them from St. Petersburg, you know, like I should, I should not waste too much. So I try to mix them with this gel. So it will look like thin, thick, but still, you know, like a reach of color. So yeah, that's why I use that uh, medium. I remember in Robert Liberace's workshop, he showed some butter, like something like that. Mm. It, do you know like something like butter like, like this medium to make that more no i don't yeah oh maybe i'm saying that wrong again but anyway so he used that too and that's where i learned that you can add something in oil so you can uh, you know like have more oils uh, is that that oleo gel stuff that i hear people talk oh yes about? yes that that was that yes yes yeah all right okay yeah, yeah. all right <laughs> yeah but I think like um, Kim's question comes and I think like a lot of people think as well. I think the fact that you're using the particle board, it's all automatically you look like you're using very thick paint before you even start. That's it. That's it. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually how it happened. Like you see the texture and like everyone, oh my God, you have such texture, but it's just that... Mm, surface although i should say like a couple of weeks i did a painting and i was really surprised that my style really changed because the painting was made on simple board like completely smooth yes. and i thought like okay i will start a portrait and it will be like you know also very uh, like smooth surface no such volume in texture but somehow i managed to do it with a lot of texture so of okay. course like board helps you but yeah but now i can figure out how to do that brush strokes maybe to make it look rich yes like yeah, texture yeah. yeah um vicky sullivan again on patreon which asks what type of tools do you use for your backgrounds is it just brushes or do you use paint uh, palette knives 
Oh, yes. Um, you know, I use a lot uh, backside of the brush like that with no hair, <laughs> that part. You know, oh, yeah, like the end of the opposite brush. side of the brush. Yeah, the end yeah, of yeah. the brush. So I use that a lot for sure. Um, like, for example, if I have a very thick brush stroke and then I can actually paint with that opposite side of brush stroke on it to give yes. it some, I don't know, like a pattern on, on clothes or, you know, like to draw something above um, if it makes sense. And what else? Um, I use my fingers a lot. That's like I've learned in St. in St. Petersburg. Uh, so I never have my manicure <laughs> because it's just useless. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think fingers and opposite side. Uh, palette knife. I don't use actually. No, I don't use that. So I think fingers and opposite side of brush. Okay. Uh, do you wear gloves? Uh, I told you about my manicure. <laughs> yes, but I, I have it always on my left hand because that's where I hold uh, the paper sheet and I can clean my brush with some uh, Sina or uh, turpentine or something like that if I need to clean. So my left hand in gloves all the time, but my right hand is dirty. So <laughs> that's how it is. Oh, okay. No, I'm more thinking about the cadmiums like... Uh that you would yeah. protect your, you know, put a barrier between you and the cadmiums. Yeah, uh, soon I will be shining at night, you know, like a phosphor. Oh, okay. Maybe somebody will see you on the street and take a picture of you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> um, yeah. So are you fussy about your brushes? Do, do you have a brand that you like to use? Do you have a, is there a type of brush that you like to use? Um, no, actually, I buy them at the same, uh, um, I forgot the name again, that uh, shop where you buy everything for building the house. Hardware How store. How was it again? Hardware, Hardware store. store. Hardware store. So I buy brushes uh, there sometimes because they're just a couple of cents. Uh, you can pay for them and they're pretty good, in, meaning that they're very like bold and very rough. And yes. I like that because it matches to my surface. Yeah. And that's how I get that like thick brush strokes and bold brush strokes. I yeah. just use cheap brushes. Yeah. And you use them for the details as well. Yeah. For details, they have a little one, like um, not very little one, but you know, I once bought a uh, rosemary brushes. They're very, very uh, famous in art, yeah. uh, art world. Yeah. But I'm still afraid to use them because they're expensive. <laughs> yeah, so I just keep them well, and they remind expensive. me that I'm a artist. Yeah, maybe, but you know, like to use them how I use them, you know, like expressive emotional style, you know, like hitting my, my um, board. Yeah, they look very beautiful for this. Too beautiful <laughs> to yeah, be okay. used. Yeah, just keep them for when the press come over. You can just get them out there. Yeah. <laughs> um yes. marie on instagram says could you dig into the topic of texture the story behind it the concept Ooh. Uh, hmm. i think my english will be not enough to explain that <laughs> you know like deep topic about digging into texture uh, I just, well, I just love texture. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I just love texture. I love how like light is, um, you know, underlying that texture, like all the shadows under brush strokes, all the shadows under that, uh, like wood uh, pieces. I just, I just feel that it's like more, it gives you more volume, like 3D effect something like that um yeah i think that's it like i just i think i just love texture i love when you know i'm a person of touching you know like a uh, tactile uh feeling tactile, yeah. Tact yeah tactile feeling and yes. um yeah so i think that why i love texture because i just 
want to touch everything and i want yeah. that feeling under my tips of fingers you know like yeah 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 i'm the same do you when you go clothes shopping or or you, like this one it doesn't have, i don't have to be clothes shopping but if i'm in a clothes shop <laughs> um more almost more than the look of whatever it is i'm looking at i'll be going down the, the rails and if i like something i'll I'll feel it i want to feel what it feels like and if it doesn't feel nice it doesn't matter how good it looks i'm like nah. <laughs> yeah totally and you know i'm like in in moscow i'm um how you say like a persona non grata like you you are not allowed to go into <laughs> some museums <laughs> because oh, okay. i do touching all the time <laughs> I didn't touch. I was just too close, but it was such a temptation, you know, like to touch that brush stroke of stroke uh, or like, painting, you know. Yeah. yeah. But you how I can understand? Arms, <laughs> yeah. Yes. I and one grandma was looking. Hey, wait, don't touch that painting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you made her day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> Um, how do you check yourself as you're working? You know, like some artists, they have mirrors or they'll turn the canvas upside down or they'll take photos on their phone or they'll squint or they'll get their friends in to give them some feedback. Well, what do you do? Um, I remember from uh, David Gray's workshop, like he teached me, uh, taught me to squint. And, um, but I use my phone all the time. I just make photos and sometimes i make them in mirror uh, reflection um yes like you flip changing them, yeah. the, the side yeah i flip them so that's how i check or i just sometimes switch on camera and just um like see on my paintings through this camera and it's nice to see like mistakes um yeah but photos on my phone helps a lot i think that's how i see like all that and my husband he's just you know like every 30 minutes coming and checking my painting and saying oh that nose is like wrong or i i is not on that position like on right place and then i just go somewhere and return and i see that so he has very good eye on my yeah art critique yeah, at home. Good. is he a painter as well <laughs> no no we like we work together actually so art is not like it's um like part of the day i'm artist part of the day i'm um i i'm doing tv advertisement like with my husband so um yeah so we work together like during the day and then in the evening i start painting but no he's not artist but he has good eye uh, on art yeah and he helps me to yeah to help me to figure out what's wrong on painting yeah that's a very good tip on the phone about flipping it. I hadn't really thought about it, but yeah, that would be exactly the same as a mirror. Would it yeah. Prov that's, provide the yeah. same thing. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's very useful. Yeah. iPhone and is always with me. <laughs> not so cumbersome and easy to move around. Because <laughs> mirrors yeah, are yeah. They're a big deal, you know. That's right, yeah. Uh, what What's your varnishing preference? Oh, I, I think I like spray that Winsor & Newton spray uh, for varnishing. I love to make Instagram videos, you know, like when you varnish and that is yeah. like varnish, varnish porn. porn. They, <laughs> yeah, they call it varnish porn. I know that it brings a lot of followers and likes when you do such uh, videos. But for me, it's, I think, just easier to spray like on, on work and it's, it dries uh, much faster. Yeah. So is that yeah, matte but for, or gloss? Does it finish matte or gloss for you? Um, I like matte. I think yeah. that's because I saw that uh, Nikolai uh, Fehin was using a lot of like he was using matte uh, varnish, and I like that. I saw his paintings on in in, in Saint Petersburg, and that matte feeling and matte look was really good. I mean, like better than when you see the shiny uh, paintings and it's yeah. you know like reflecting everything and you just can't see, see anything yeah yeah i'm not wild about glass varnish myself oh yes yes yeah it's funny francis bacon he always insisted yeah that of his, course i know i know him. He, he always insisted that his paintings were um put behind glass <laughs> really why yeah. where's that he just that was his thing he just liked it 
okay. <laughs> I know. Okay. <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe so nobody can see that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think glass is even worse. It's like, you know, it's worse than gloss varnish. It's, you know, yeah, the lights have to be exactly right for you to be able to actually see the painting. But yeah, that was his thing. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. What kind of lighting setup do you have in your studio, both your temporary studio there and in your <laughs> main studio back in, in uh, Germany? Yeah. I'm like, I'm like that gypsy, you know, like moving around. <laughs> um, Very poetic. <laughs> yeah, <they're, laughs> I know, I know. So in Germany, I have like three lights. Um, what like two of them is neutral color, like not neutral light, not like very cold and not very warm. Yep. And yeah, they all look up like on the ceiling, so they okay. reflect the light from the ceiling to the room. Um, otherwise, everything is just because of the texture. Uh, I just everything shines like a yes, diamond, right. you know, like, yes. So, um, yeah, and one light is from the side and more on my palette. So I can see the colors better. Um, yeah, so I have three lights. And in my improvisorish uh, studio in Portugal, I have just one light and that's the light, you know, like when you make Instagram videos, it's that circle of light the with, light, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. So that's what I could find here. I just I just couldn't find anything else. So I'm just trying to survive and even with that yeah, light. Yeah. They're pretty good though. If you get a like a, yeah. big, a bigish one, yeah, you, they can yeah, put out quite a bit of light, and it's it's not. Too, I was surprised. It's not too sharp or something. It, it's not like it's a soft light. Yeah, and not very expensive. I mean, like professional art, uh, uh, professional art lamps or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like you got another, a lot of natural light there as well, though. Yeah, um, I'm painting Portugal. I have like a little studio on the roof. So I have two windows uh, from the sides of um, the roof. Like they're not, how you say, so they're like from the sides. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm showing sure that. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here in Ireland, they're called Velox windows, but I think they're like dormer windows. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, so yeah. a lot of light. But during the day, I like normally work. So yeah, when I finish work, I just try fast to catch that light or uh, sunset, you know, like to paint yeah, a yeah. little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what do you listen to or do you listen to anything as you're working? Um, yeah, of course, like your podcast. <laughs> of course. <laughs> It goes without saying. <laughs> Everyone says that, right? Uh, no, actually, I think it goes without saying, oh. so they don't say it. <laughs> um, no, some people do, but not everybody. Yeah, but it's actually true. Like I'm listening to your podcast for years, and it's like so cool because so, almost all my favorite artists were on your podcast and when you wrote me i was just like speechless for half an hour i think just like walking you know like shocked <laughs> with big eyes yeah um but then music on spotify um i don't know like something like nina simona um etta jones like that like i love that kind of music um sometimes maybe some classical but that's too boring i think like i mean not boring in like meaning in that classical music is boring but i think every artist say i'm listening to classical music so i won't say that like everyone <laughs> listen to classical music yeah so i and i love kind of you know exotic music like if it's uh for example like brazilian or portuguese or like portuguese fado I'm sure you know that father music. Uh, Do you know that father? So. No. Oh, it's like uh, old style of Portuguese music when like very emotional and very uh, like they're telling s stories about. Oh yeah, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. remember when we were in Porto, we just went for dinner in this place, and we didn't yeah. know, and. Yeah, there was a guy just in the corner. He just stood up and he started singing. 
hadn't a clue what he was talking about, but it sounded like the most tragic thing. I was almost crying into my dinner and I didn't even know why. It just sounded so awful. Then he started singing a love song with this other lady and that was really moving as well. Uh, yeah, so yeah, can... yeah, that's father. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. That's yeah. exactly father, yes. And they always have that dramatic light. They normally like have a dark room with maybe light above. So they have just shadows like... Uh, you know, in movies, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like father is also nice. Yeah, yeah. I loved Portugal. Um, I found Portuguese. I don't know. Maybe you find this, but because I didn't understand what anybody was saying, uh, like you know, like you can get a sense from um other languages. You get a, you sort of without knowing what they're saying, you can kind of feel like um you get a feeling for them, like um say um like german for example if somebody is talking german it can sound a bit like they're angry if you don't know what they're saying right. just the, the shape oh, of the language russian is a little bit like that as well um whereas say french you know they just sound like they're trying to seduce you all the time doesn't matter what they're saying they could be giving you specifications for new buildings and it just sounds like they're just you know, <laughs> saying very seductive things to you. I know. But with, with Portuguese, it sounds like they're complaining the whole time <laughs> to me. Really? Say, yeah. <laughs> and I, that's terrible if you're Portuguese, I'm sorry. But just to my ear, when I can't hear them, they just, it sounds like they're, yeah, complaining or they're upset or they're whinging. <laughs> that's terrible. But that's what it sounds yeah. like to my ear. Do you have that at all? Um, I don't know about complaining, but I don't know. <laughs> that was really funny complaining all the time. Uh, you're totally right about French. I think I would add Italian language to that too, like very sexy language. It, it is, but it can also sound like they're fighting with you. Yeah, nobody talked with um, me like that. Maybe because I'm a girl. <laughs> <laughs> no no but i mean if you're watching a movie and and you're not seeing the subtitles it can sound it can it depends it can flip over very quickly into sounding like they're having a fight um same yeah, with greek greek is greek is very like that as well it, it can I'm be interesting how russian sounds to you that's like how, how do you feel about russian um yeah um a bit scary actually <laughs> <laughs> That's why so, nobody wants to pose for me. <laughs> now you understand. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, I think it depends. I think women speaking Russian sounds, you know, not so scary. But men speaking Russian, if I don't know what they're talking about, I sort of feel like I'm in trouble. <laughs> don't, yeah, I can imagine. Why. Yeah, I can imagine like uh, once I came to one woman uh, in Germany and uh, it was just beginning of my like living in Germany. So my German was not so good. And I spoke with such a like, you know, bright Russian accent. And I said to her, I invited her to make some photos at my home. And maybe because it sounds something like, hi, can you please come to my home and I will make some photos for you. You know, like something like that. And I think you just, she just maybe saw Putin behind me. I don't know, but she ran away like crazy. <laughs> well, there's a big difference between saying, you come to my home and I'll make some photos for you and come to my home and I'll make some photos of you. Oh, damn. Big difference. <laughs> oh, God. I stole the joke. I stole the joke. Okay. Normal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, Russian always strikes me as it sounds like it's a great language for swearing in. Like it's almost oh, sounds yeah, like it was built true. for swearing. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Do you know that we have like kind of dictionary of swear words and it's pretty sick? Like it's a very big <laughs> book. I'm no, not I joking. Didn't. I'm not surprised, but I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I even I didn't know that people can can, you know, like kind combine words to another words and to another words like such a rich you know imagination the russian people have it's just <laughs> amazing i was surprised <laughs> um, yeah now my cheeks are pain <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so considering you have some unorthodox approaches like the um, painting on the board and so on, are there any quirky tools that you have or things that you do that you haven't heard anybody else doing? Mm -hmm. um, I was using uh, acetone once, twice, like a couple of times. Acetone, acetone. is that like, yeah, like you, you remove your uh, nail uh, like nail colors British from remember, your nail. Yeah. Yes, so I was using that in the background to, you know, make it like uh, that flow. I, I don't know, is it the word in English? Like to disappear at the end, like kind of. Blend. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, I don't know, you're asking me, <laughs> I have no idea. Well, were you, make, were you using it to create a kind of watercolor feeling or yeah, to dilute like the that. paint to make it blend into nothing like a smooth I think even watercolor. blend more like a no, watercolor no i think what watercolor feeling so it's like funny because for example face has that volume of oil paints and then uh, background is just like as a watercolor but since yes. it's uh, but, but still it's an oil yeah but then like another part another side of my brush as i said that i'm using a lot in oil paintings i use a lot of uh, colored uh, pencils Okay. Um, yeah, just like in background or sometimes in some like uh, pattern on clothes, something like that. Are they those but oil like... pencils or just your? No, regular... just simple, yeah. just regular. Uh, what else? Once I used um, something like just a, like a piece of clothes, like to not to make my fingers dirty, so I just clean some parts of that sometimes i use that too but like not rag. like yeah like something like that but i don't have anything like like weird or how, how it was in question that word quirky quirky yeah quirky, <laughs> yes no nothing like not so crazy <laughs> all all normal all, all natural all right and um, how do you name your paintings oh yeah so um i usually and as i said you remember i said that about that uh, letters to milena uh yep. paintings i made for nft and that's how i actually name my works normally i take i had for example i have an inspiration that's the kafka's book and i just take uh some words from the quotes for example or from the um from the book that suits to the painting or to idea of this painting yeah so usually names of my paintings are like parts of someone's book yeah for example Kerouac on the road I use a lot okay yeah yeah something like that um yeah so and do you have those before you start the painting or you kind of stand back from the painting and then go oh, this would fit well with this painting yeah, at the end, at the end, I, I, as I, as I told you, I never know what will be on my board, like when I started. So it's all happens at the end when I see the whole image. I actually never know how to finish that, you know, like that feeling. And I've heard so many artists talked about that. Like they don't, that's, you know, like moment when you know that the painting is finished. I don't like, yes. do you know when your paintings are finished? Like that moment. Know. Yeah, I do. Oh, know. you know? They oh, they, okay. They tell me, yeah. <laughs> share, share with us your knowledge. Oh, no, they just tell me, like, that's it. Stop. Oh. Finished. Like, oh, okay. And then uh, what's been happening lately is the name will come almost at the same time. And both are a bit of a shock to me because I didn't realize it was finished, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, I, um, okay. I thought that is like going to. Uh, sounds crazy but since you said that I can share with you some of my uh, experience I sometimes feel that painting is finished when they wink me like with one eye like wink oh okay the, the, uh, figure, I don't know yeah. why <laughs> I just look at painting and it wink me and then I said oh okay it's finished but I thought it sounds crazy so I didn't want to say that but you said that first so they said you they, they talk with you so at least nobody talks with me <laughs> yeah 
Uh, Chris Rehring on Patreon. Thanks for the tea, Chris. <laughs> says, hi, Tanya. I discovered you from your painting of a mother and child. Your treatment was bold, direct and confrontational with the stunning use of color and composition. I wondered if you consider yourself a German painter. I really love modern German artists with their historic expressionism. It seems to me there are other figurative artists from Germany working in this fearlessly expressive manner, and I wonder if you agree. I see that you moved from Russia, where there is also a history of dynamic and strong composition, but I'm more familiar with historic Russian graphic design than painting. Thank you, John, for all you do. You're welcome, Chris. Yes, thank you, John. I agree <laughs> for, for everything you do. That's really beautiful. Um, You're welcome, Tanya. <laughs> No, it's, it is really. I'm just. Um, I I adore your podcast. So I just, since we have uh, we're talking about that, I wanted to edit again. So well, um, answering uh, the question. Um, so from contemporary artists, as I said, I adore uh, Ruprecht von Kaufmann, and um, I think like he's really one of the greatest German artists, like contemporary artists, our days. Uh, another. German artist I love is Katie Kolwitz. Yeah, um, yeah uh, Katie Kolwitz, I think I pronounced that correctly. And um, uh, yeah, I think from German artists, that's what I can remember for now. But I think all my that expressive style came from St. Petersburg, actually, like from, from Russian uh, school. Um, and all that brush strokes and all that expressive um, movements in, and composition. I think everything came from St. Petersburg uh, more. And, you know, like inside, I still, you know, like we say, uh, the Russian people, whenever they live, wherever they live, they have Russian soul always. So yeah. maybe, maybe I still have that. So that's why I can't say that I'm a German painter. I would say I'm like a Russian German painter since I live in Germany. And now I can add I'm a Russian German Portuguese painter since I live in <laughs> Portugal. As I said, like art gypsy or something like that. <laughs> um is your husband uh, Russian as well or is he from Germany? No, he's Russian as well. But he's living he's in Germany well. like for a long time. So his mentality is like more German. But soul is still Russian. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, you don't want to get into a poet, poet, poetic competition with an Irishman, all right? Because <laughs> we'll win. I know. I know for sure. For sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I wish I could. I could visit Ireland one day. This is like I have two countries in my like dream list. This is Ireland and Scotland. Oh, okay. And I, yeah, and I really wish I can because I feel like you have that, you know, like first of all, nature and that beautiful melancholic, you know, silence in air. That's what I actually love that feeling. Yeah, maybe I should come in winter, right? Like to see that, or is it better to like autumn or something? Yeah, towards the end of summer. But I mean, you always run a risk in Ireland. It depends on how much time you have to come because you always run the risk that it could be raining the whole time and you can't see anything except the rain. Okay. <laughs> so that's why most people come in the summer because you've got a much better chance of, of uh, <laughs> you know, in, if you just come for a week, you could have a whole week of rain, you know. Um, oh. But yeah, the winter, all the seasons are beautiful here. You know, the winter is lovely summer is good i think i prefer autumn winter you know spring um i like summer as well but it's um i think the others are more they've got more um depth to them yeah i know you do a lot of meditation and i wanted to ask you too. yeah is it yeah so uh, i wanted to ask you did you like try that uh with rain you know like focusing on rain sound i think it should be like absolutely magnificent feeling um, since you have a lot mean... of rain <laughs> yeah i don't have to i don't have to put it on as you know, i could just open the window and <laughs> i can hear it yeah <laughs> um but not not specifically no no yeah i just once i did like a meditation uh it was in thailand 
and you know like that tropical uh rain it's something yes. like a heavy rain it's just yeah. such as noise and power you know like of nature yes. you can feel that and it was yeah. such a powerful moment for me i, I just remember that uh, that's why i thought maybe rain helps uh, you know like to come to this feeling you know yeah no no i pretty much meditate anywhere um but the th on instagram like, as well <laughs> on instagram yeah i've stopped doing that now but yeah i did that for like two yeah. years um but you know in in um iceland and greenland you know they have 23 different names for snow and ice it's similar in ireland like there's so many different types it's not like we have the names um but um the sort of tropical downpour you're talking about i know them from australia and papua new guinea and it's very different it's a very different thing you know yeah. Be because it rains so much here it's always kind of part of the the discussion it's always part of what's going on whereas when the rain comes down like that in the in the tropics you know everything has to change Stop. because yeah. it's a new yeah. thing it's like it's raining <laughs> you know there's no <laughs> yeah. you can't keep going with what you're doing you've got to change to something new or stop what altogether you know so there's yeah there's so many oh, different nature. types of rain here um that uh it it really does just blend into the background you know yeah but i can totally understand that was a powerful scene like rain and it took us like two weeks you know we couldn't go even outside because then there was a water coming uh, out yeah. like a fl fluid and oh god that was such a disaster yeah <laughs> yeah but anyway you definitely should come to ireland you know and if you come, come yeah i will me. i will yeah oh thank you me. i will yeah. <laughs> um I did that one. Michael Shapcott on Instagram says, amazing work. What materials do you use and how long does a typical painting take to complete? So you've covered the material side of things, but how long does a painting mm -hmm. take you? Um, so since I like um, combine my art with my work, um, I like usually paint it like mostly in the evening. So I usually have like, three two three hours to paint a day and um that's why it's a little bit longer because i don't have like all day you know like focusing on one painting but i think like for portraits 30 on 40 centimeters is kind of like a week uh if you count like three hours per day or something like that yeah. maybe maybe less okay what i'm talking about no it's less for sure uh let's say like three days two three days yeah so that would be almost a day and a half or a day and three quarters of full time if you were to do it full time yeah i think a day a day would be okay for like portrait especially if it's commissioned then i have to focus on details and to you know like look alike and yeah so i would say a day for such a portrait okay yeah i'm a slowly uh, person <laughs> well that sounds very fast to me but okay Oh, okay. um, oh. <laughs> Rebecca Griffith in Colorado says, how has your work evolved over the years? Um, uh, pretty much, I should say. Like, remember I told you that uh, time when I found that um, plywood for it? I think yep. it was like around two, three years ago. And since that, when I started painting this surface, like I had uh, really, you know, like, my my approach um changed and my style changed slowly with that like using that board and um i think every year i paint brighter and brighter more colorful and more colorful i don't know what will be in five years i think i will just you, you know like use lamps instead of oils <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. yeah so i think it just and I also noticed that um, my composition also changed. So before it was like a little bit, um, you know, like face should be there, like three quarters, you know, divide yeah. on third quarter. Yeah, that normal rules for art composition. But now I just like, oh, why not face to be here? You know, like, and then hands to be there. And I cut half of the face and I cut half of the hands. Like now I'm 
a little bit braver than before. And that's yep. with every year. Is, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So are the multi figure um, paintings, are they more recent? Is that a new kind of um, addition for you? Like, you mean like duets, right? Like a two person on the painting? Two people, yeah. 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 You know, like, um, um, I think I always, when I paint, even if it's a portrait of one person, I always think about two. I don't know why, but I, like, I paint, I try to paint the story. Like, even if the story is told with uh, eyes of the object, uh, subject that I'm painting, but there is always a story between two people. And if I paint one person with sad eyes, I always think about the story that this person is connected to another person. And there was some story behind. And that's why he's staying so sad here. And that's why he's like, you know, covering his jacket because it's a wind and maybe he's waiting for someone, you know, like that scene. So even if I paint one person, I always think about like the second in the story. But when I can make a composition of two people and when I can find a, like a model or, you know, like inspiration for that or like reference for that pose, then I, I love to paint duets. I love to paint two people. It's kind of like a, uh, you know, like a puzzles, like a game between two souls, you know, like that's a story, you know, not, yeah. it's a story of two people. Yeah. I hope you understand what I mean. I do. But you yeah. do, I'm sure. You <laughs> I do. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so when you paint two people, is the is that both sides of the story for you, or are there four people? If you know what I mean, like you know when you paint Ooh. one person, it's like two people. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when you actually paint two people, is it is that the completion of that, or is it like no, there's the story expands. So you mean like a geometrical progression, right? Like if I have two, then it's four, four, then it's... <laughs> I hadn't thought about it like that, but yes, okay, let's call it that, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I never thought about that. That's actually a cool idea. I can tell that story is that when I paint two people, there are more like people. <laughs> but no, I actually like, I love to focus on two, like connection between two people that connected with invisible thread or something. You know, so yeah. when you see two people, there are still two people. When you see one people, then it's two people. Okay. Yes. So that's the okay. rules of the game. <laughs> okay. Right. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, God, I'm really enjoying this podcast. I've listened to a few now and they're brilliant. And there's so many of them. And I've learned so much from listening to them. And you know what? If I met that John Dalton fellow in real life... I'd love to buy him a cup of tea and have a chat with him. I'd love to do that every month if I could. Well, now you can. The tea part, at least, because this podcast runs on cups of tea bought for me by people like you who listen to the podcast and send me the price of a cup of tea once a month through the Patreon account. That's patreon.com forward slash John Dalton gently does it. All one word. And if you're one of those people who already send me cups of tea through Patreon, thanks a million. The tea is lovely. And I really appreciate it. Now, the great thing is that if you can't afford to send me the price of a cup of tea or you don't want to, that's fine. You still get exactly the same podcast for free. It's sort of an honor system where the people who can afford it and want to pay for the people who can't or don't want to. So it's all lovely. So if you'd like to send me a cup of tea once a month, you can do that through Patreon. I'd really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference to me. Yeah, okay. Matthias uh, Samakul in Sweden says, Hey, John, a question I'd really like to hear the answer to, not only from Tanya, but from all your guests. What makes a painting great? It's a difficult question, isn't it? I was asked this by Ode Nerdrum, and he didn't like my answer at all. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts on it, Tanya. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Mm. Yeah, I, I chat with uh, with him actually, and um, yeah, I, I I told him already. Thank you for making me ner more nervous for this podcast because I was not enough nervous, you know. Like, yeah, because now um, old Nerdrum's listening now. Yeah, I know. It's just who does it, you know? Like before, like a little girl start podcast and she's nervous, and you ask such question. Um, okay, so. 
Okay, I would say like that. Um, so in my opinion, like it's not just a harmony of, uh, you know, like subject, composition, colors, technique and everything, but maybe painting is great when it's like, if it's in simple words, when it's great for you. I mean, like art is very subjective and, you know, um, if this painting inspires you, even if it's not very popular and maybe someone who stay near just will go and pass it away. But if this painting inspires you so much and you can't move, you know, like you can't go from it, maybe this painting is great. Like after all, we can't tell, you know, like that, what is great, what is not, what is beautiful, what is not, because people are so different. And um, I have an example. Um, yesterday I went like hours, just to see one painting in one little city in Portugal. And that painting of artist José Maloya. Maloya sounds, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And um, the painting called The Drunks. And I went so far away just to see that painting in life, you know, and because it's great for me. But this artist is not very popular. It's not in famous museums, you know, like it's not like such a, top artist that yeah. you say oh that artist is so great but that painting you know touched my heart so that i wanted to move and go there where it is and see that in my eyes you know like and i was staying in front of it like hour just um just you know like looking at it so yeah maybe that's that's my answer and beauty is in the eye of the beholders like that's how you say it. so maybe yep. the great great scene is what you find great i hope that's the correct answer <laughs> is there is a correct answer there <laughs> hang on i'm just getting a message from ode <laughs> uh yeah i agree with you that's what i exactly what i would have said um oh, really it matter what, yeah it doesn't matter what anybody else says like uh, i mean really like isn't it like great art is is when it, a lot of people find it moving but that doesn't mean like there's no it, it, it doesn't nat naturally follow that just because a lot of people find it moving that it's a great painting for you and like it ha i think it has to like as you say it, if it moves you then it's a great painting um yeah i'm the same there's lots of paintings that i love that i haven't heard anybody else talking about and then there's lots of paintings yeah, yeah. that i love that lots of people say oh yeah that that's fantastic um, yeah absolutely so. yeah sometimes you stay in the museum and you you know like uh people say it's a great painting and you just you know stay in front of this painting and you feel nothing it's just like okay it's beautiful <laughs> yes i know that's it's, terrible isn't it <laughs> yeah it's just you feel oh my god am i an artist What's wrong with or me? why i'm not feeling anything <laughs> right but yeah, that's how it yeah. happens like you just and people say it's great, but I don't have any feelings to this painting. It's not like, you know, touching my heart. My heart is not melting when I see this painting. But some, yeah. you know, like little sketches or little, I don't know, etudes, you just can't move and you just stare at it like 30 minutes because it's yeah. great for you. It, yeah. yeah. Same with painters. Ooh, There's some painters was, who... Yeah. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I... I just wanted to say that was a tough exam, so and I, I hope I said <laughs> the correct answer. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's same with painters. There's some painters who don't get any, you know, recognition, but then they're fantastic, and I, I like pretty much everything they do. And so I think, I think what we've arrived at, Tanya, is that it's actually there's two parts to this. There's the like the overriding thing for yourself is, do you think it's great? Does it move you? And then right. the other side of it is popularity. <laughs> it's like what what are considered great paintings are really just paintings that a lot of people think are are, are a lot of people are moved by. Um, so yeah. it's you know I found that with the Mona Lisa actually when I saw the Mona yeah, Lisa same. I was a bit like okay this is going to be brilliant and it's like wow it's tiny number one um and luckily i saw it years and like probably 30 years ago when there wasn't a you know a room full of twenty thousand people that you had to see it through oh, i wow. could see it pretty pretty close up 
And I was like, like, yeah, waiting for this spotlight to come down from heaven and, you know, tears and (laughs) nothing. I was just like, well, it's it's nice. But I think it's been overhyped for me. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like going yeah, to going to a movie yeah. when everyone has said, "Oh, you're going to love this movie. It's so good. It's yeah. you're gonna, you you are going to love this movie. <laughs> it's so fantastic." And then when you you go in with very high expectations, and then it's like, uh, it wasn't that great? <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, it was what a bit like that with about. the Mona Lisa. Yeah. 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 Same. Same. No, I totally agree. So yeah, that would be my answer. Then that's yeah, that's my answer. If you agree, I agree, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, now we have a lot of questions about NFTs, so we'll just start into them. Vanessa oh, Hawking Creek in the UK says, how did you get involved in NFTs and can you explain what it's all about? <laughs> okay, I knew there will be questions about NFT. <laughs> I was afraid there will be, but they, they are here. I didn't, even okay, know you so... were, I didn't even know you were into NFTs before I Ooh. asked you. Really? I yeah, am. Yeah, but it's great that and... you are. So it's a whole other thing. I actually, but you know, you know what's that, right? So you, because some people, when I start talking, they're like, is it some disease? You know, like kind of that thing. Like, yeah. So, okay. So NFT. So NFT is like non-fungible token. And like in simple words, it's kind of ownership that is recorded on blockchain. And blockchain is kind of like a, um, like a database um, where all information uh, is lying. And um, so it's like kind of code. And why we say non-fungible, it's like, for example, Bitcoin is fungible uh, thing. Like you can replace it with another Bitcoin and you can exchange it to another Bitcoin. It will be equal. But um, I was thinking about some example from the like physical life to explain non-fungible token. And I thought about the book since I'm very poetic, you know, like you remember that. <laughs> yes. And, uh, so I thought like like there is, there are um, hundreds of editions of some book. They're equal. You can exchange one book to another. But if writer sign signs one book, then this book is something special and it's uh, not not replaceable with same book of like of that writer because it's signed. So that's like in simple words uh, what NFT is. You can't replace it to another NFT. Um, what else? So, like in my opinion, it's a great way to sell your art, to buy art, to collect art. And for traditional artists, I think it's a great tool, um, like to sell art. For second, is to find new collectors because it's a huge field of new collectors and new perspective for artists, especially traditional artists. And I forgot what was the question about. How did you get I into it? I started talking about NFT. <laughs> okay, yeah. How did you get involved in um, it? Yes. All uh, right. So it was in April last year. and That's 2021. My, yeah, 2021. And uh, one of my friends, that Ivan Loginov I was talking about uh, before, he told me that there is um, a platform like a marketplace where you can sell photos of your paintings. And I was so surprised and I wanted to try it immediately because I'm very curious and I'm a fan of new technologies and everything, you know, like something new. So I tried that and um, I put a close up of my oil painting, a poet from St. Moritz. Um, It's a close up where you can see the texture of oils and wood, uh, just a face. So this part of the portrait. And it was sold like in like few minutes, actually. And for me, it was just like, oh, my God, <laughs> like people really buy JPEGs, you know, like that kind of thing, like the first. But then I start like learning more about this technology and like, you know, uh, digging deeper into that uh, theme. And um, sorry, just to go back. Yeah. A bit, was that first okay. one you sold? Was that just a straight JPEG or <laughs> was it actually an NFT? Uh, so it was NFT. So it was like right. a photo of my painting in high quality, and it was a close up. So it was just a detail of the whole portrait, right? So it yeah. was just a face. And um, yeah, so the format was JPEG. That's why I said JPEG. But yeah. 
Yeah, okay. that's well, it's more just because it's very easy to get <laughs> confused. <laughs> like the yeah, for sure. If, if yeah. I'm, you know, like a like a JPEG that you can download from Pinterest, that's not an NFT because built into no. the NFT is the non fungibility that you're talking about, where it's a one off, one of a kind, and it's traceable yeah. on the blockchain. Yeah, so it's kind of like we should see that as a like smart contract or like contract that's connected with these JPEGs, right? Like, uh, so it's not just image, it's actually like a code that yeah. is written on blockchain. Um, and the, the thing is you can't um, replace that uh, info, right? Like in that code, yeah. you can't change that, you can delete that. It's like for forever. It's like if you're a creator of this painting and that was sold as NFT, you're always for all life, you know, like they're going to stay as a creator. And the huge plus in like advantage in NFT that you get royalties uh, from the secondary sales. Like, yeah. I mean, like you never know what happens with your painting when you sold to someone, to private collection, and then this person sold it uh, to another person, yeah, got some money, but you didn't, didn't get anything from this. But in NFT, you always get, and it just goes automatically to your wallet. And um, I think it's a huge world. advantage for artists. <laughs> yeah, you're digital, I'm sorry. I'm, you know, like I'm talking already, like everyone knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so digital wallet, that's right. And you always get that royalties from secondary and you always stay as a creator of painting and you get that secondary, uh, from each secondary sales, you get the royalties. So you always, you know, like if your painting, NFT painting is like successful and it's going sales and resales and resales. So you get money all the time. And it's very nice because, you know, like as a creator, you know where your painting is, you know, like who bought it and yeah. you get royalties. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So you were, I, you were saying you <laughs> sold your first one. It sold within minutes. You were delighted and that's it. You were Absolutely. In. I'm in from now on. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, I just like, you know, it was interesting because first how, you know, and second, I was thinking, okay, how it works, you know, because it yeah. was, um, after some time when all that adrenaline left me, I was thinking like, wow, like how this technology works. And uh, I started searching for that. I said, um, first of all, I got my Twitter. I know like almost no one has the Twitter like from tr traditional art world. And that's actually a key to NFT community and NFT sales. Um, because everyone, like all collectors, NFT community are in Twitter. So right. if you want to start NFT, just go to Twitter. <laughs> yeah. But now, you know, I'm sitting on Twitter more than on Instagram because all my connections are there now and all my like collectors are there. I mean, it's such a huge perspective for, for traditional artists. And it was so funny. I was um, like uh, with Arcadia in LA art show last year and like you know traditional art was next to NFT because above the corner the super rare it's a, a NFT platform the fancy one had the huge place for NFT uh, to display NFT um, it was just amazing how traditional art stays near uh, NFTs you know like yes. that it's yeah it's all together and yeah this was at the so, la art fair did you say yeah yes yeah yes. right this year it was the same and even more people was uh in super rare corner so yeah okay we'll keep going with the questions um, okay michael shapcott on instagram says in your opinion are nfts the future of art and what advice do you have for artists just getting into the nft space okay um, okay, so first of all, uh, NFT is, I, in my opinion, and I think I think should uh, artists also see that as a new tool. We shouldn't be like against it. It's a new tool that we can use to sell our art. And um, I also talked with so many artists and they said, yeah, but NFT, you post your picture and someone can, I don't know, print it or something. And I want to say that NFT is like you still have as a 
creator and artist you still have all copyrights and reproductions right like after it's yours right like as a, with physical paintings and i think as a future of nft is um i think it will be a combination of traditional art world and nft because i see how many galleries are moving into nft world now and they're selling nfts and um having now that screens that showing nfts and i mean like christie's Sotheby's, like so many auction houses are selling nfts right now so it's like i think it's like the future of um like art market for sure and we can't ignore it right now because it's too you know like uh too aggressive it's going aggressive into our lives and um yeah, I think like just artists should uh, use that tool. And um, what was the question again? Was it like about the advices? For <laughs> yeah, how do you how to get into it? So it was what what is is our NFTs the future of art? That was the first bit, and then yes. how do, how do fine artists get into it? Yeah, um, I hope I answered first uh, first part. Did I? Was it like an answer? <laughs> <laughs> like almost i don't okay, know i, I wasn't listening like yes you did <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um oh, yeah so you sweet. did thank you so much <laughs> okay um i think so well just, here's here's my bit right i think the real future okay. not the real future i think another or what's really exciting for you know um classical kind of artists is when the smart contract part of the current digital nfts when that gets adopted into um physical art so that it just becomes standard when you sell a painting through a gallery that you maintain the royalty structure and that uh, not only as part of the provenance of the painting uh you you know the way like a gallery will keep check of who owns it and you know how many owners it that that each each resale that you'll get royalties back from it i think that would be beautiful yeah Oh, did you hear? Did you hear about digital? Do you know no. what's that? No. Okay, I will tell you. That's a huge thing. I think, in my opinion, it's a huge thing. So yesterday I sold that NFT, and I sold NFT plus physical. So it's one edition, and you sell NFT. So the picture is NFT, right? Like so, as token, and this NFT goes with physical piece. And that's a, like usually sell NFT plus physical. So the owner gets NFT and I send him or her the physical piece. So he gets right. like everything, body and soul, as I say, like of, of yes. painting. Yeah. So uh, there is like one um, like company that calls V Chain, uh, V W E Chain, like V Chain. Yes. And they in make digital. So it's like physical and digital in one word. And what yes. they do, they have a stickers. It's kind of stickers like that you use to make some, you know, like uh, comments with your phone, like to switch on phone, uh, switch on lights, switch off light, you know, with just uh, touching with phone. Do you know that? So it's anyway. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. it's, not, it, it's not a QR code. You're not talking about that kind of thing. No, 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 no. no. It's, uh, yeah, it's so a sticker it's like, with the chip in it. Right. So it's a sticker. Yeah. You um, you put it on the canvas or like a panel or something like a, a way you're painting is, right? Yeah. So you put it behind and anyone with phone can uh, read the all information just to, you know, like um, how you pay with Apple, uh, Apple uh, yes. Pay or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you come, for example, it's art gallery, like how I see that for future. So you come in art gallery and you see beautiful painting, right? And since like, um, you know, like NFT is coming into our life, you can just scan with your phone a painting you like, and then you see all information, first of all, about the creator, uh, all information about NFT that goes with this piece. And you see all like whom it was sold, like what uh, what price it was. Well, so you see all history of this painting, actually. Yes. And I think it's very exciting because we finally connect, you know, like physical and digital piece into yeah. one, like digital. 
And I was yes. so excited yesterday because they're going to send me the sticker and I will put it on that painting and send to the owner. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it reminds me of um, the microchips they put in pets. <laughs> yeah. <so I'm> not... <laughs> you know, like our dogs are microchipped and the, the vet has the reader and he can tell all sorts of things from it, you know. Yeah, Similar. something like that. But you, you always stay as a creator of this painting. I think it's really good. And you always get that royalties and you always, you know, you stay as an artist all life long. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. I think yeah. I interrupted you. <laughs> did you, um, wait, did you finish saying what you were saying? Uh, I think I still didn't answer that question, giving advices <laughs> for artists. <laughs> Well, but there's more. Normal. There's a lot more coming up. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> at the okay. end, at the end, I think uh, you. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, because they're, they're sort of a similar. Um, Nikki creates, or sorry, Rinicky creates on uh, Instagram says, uh, "How and where do you sell your NFTs?" And Francesca visit in Arizona says love her work and your podcast okay thank you Francesca a question I have that I'm sure others have how can a fine artist start with NFTs and Christopher Reamers on Patreon thanks for the tea Christopher says super excited for this one John thanks for bringing her on to the podcast uh, I'm currently trying to wrap my head around the best way to approach NFTs as a traditional contemporary painter what advice do you have for navigating that space and building value stability? Is there a network, and in brackets blockchain, that you prefer for artists? Tezos versus Ethereum or Polygon, etc. Thank you for your answers. I love your work. Wow, <laughs> a lot of questions. Uh, oh, but I'm, you know, I'm really happy that so many people are into NFTs. <laughs> So from traditional art world, it's really exciting. Um, okay, where do I start? Uh, should I? I think should I start with advices how to start? Yeah, how, 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 how to get started? How would you advise them to get started? Okay, so first uh, step, you you get a Twitter. Like you, you should absolutely hundred uh, percent have a Twitter account uh, because so many platforms. Um, you need a verification with Twitter and without it, you just can't be verified, verificate. Um, and verification, is that that blue NFT. tick thing? Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So like almost all uh, platforms need that Twitter verification. Otherwise, like people will be just afraid uh, to buy something for you because they will think you're like kind of, I don't know, uh, scammer or something, you know? Yeah. So, so, Twitter is definitely the number one. Uh, and second, you need to build kind of like community around you and be in this community because NFT is all about like connection, community, all together, you know, because it's like a circle and you need to go into that circle. Uh, so you can meet all that collectors, you can meet uh, artists that, for example, uh, insane um like traditional from the same background like traditional background so you have you know it's interesting for you to be there and yeah. um about platforms um oh and another maybe advice is to make your story for example you like on instagram you know like you get followers only if you have interesting instagram like you post videos you post like uh you know like behind the scene uh videos you post like process etc etc so same on twitter like and so like collectors can see you and find you interesting you need to be like interesting you need to have some story um and platforms so i use a lot of platforms like uh, foundation um variable non-origin um i don't know what else open c and, and what are those platforms Sorry? for what are those platforms for yeah, it's kind of Amazon, like you sell and buy art there. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we're kind of uh, yeah, we're kind of Amazon. And another one is on Tezos. Um, it's Object.com. That's also like cool because there you can sell multiply editions and like Tezos is a little bit less um, 
like less less expensive than uh, Ethereum platforms. Um, what else? Uh, what question didn't I answer yet? So I okay, send so advice. The get, get on Twitter and and demonstrate mm -hmm. you're an artist and do all the usual things you do on Instagram. Then and connect with people. Connect with people. Then you. Do you go? Are you, are you recommending going on a few different platforms, or are you just kind of experimenting with them? Okay, I would start like if you're just absolutely new in NFT, I would start with Tezos. It's uh, platformobject.com because it's first of all it's less expensive. In foundation, you have to have some uh, budget to start, and it's sometimes really expensive. If gas prices are expensive, you have to pay for uh, like double for minting and listing your work on that platform. Yeah, so just and... explain what gas is. Okay. <laughs> so um, it's the money you have to pay so that uh, like a computer put your token on blockchain, like something like that. It's like a fee you pay for that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and it, that varies kind of, from platform to platform. Yes, yes. More, like foundation, I think, is most expensive, right? And because people, I don't know why, but people want to go into foundation all the time and they try to find invitation because you can't go into foundation like just like that, like OpenSea. You need an invite. So someone invites you, you know? So it's yep. so difficult. Everything is so like marketing, everything. But the object is, easy you can sell your sketches you can sell like uh etudes you know like that and i also think nft is nice to try some mediums you know like something maybe you wanted to try before like animation or 3d or i don't know adding some music you know like into your paintings like something like that you know you can try so many things and make something interesting so yeah um what else about platforms um so do think, all the platforms um like they um like you have lots of different currencies cryptocurrencies uh not all are suitable for nfts is that right yeah like there is ethereum tezos and then solana is also has a nft platform and then Ash, A S H, you can sell uh, on OpenSea for that coin too. Uh, Polygon, I was asking my friends, uh, like NFT collectors, about that Polygon thing, and they were saying since it's like, um, so Polygon makes your gas like less expensive. Uh, it, I don't know, like it's technical how to explain that. It, it's going to be boring, but anyway, so Polygons you usually used by scammers so not so many collectors want to uh, buy for polygons um yeah so i wouldn't recommend that but tezos is i think it's a cool oh and yesterday i was on new platform world of v and they sell for vet vet uh, coin and it's also interesting because it's the greenish uh nft platform ever and nft uh technology ever so it's also cool. Yeah, I was going to so, ask you about that. How do you um, reconcile the environmental impact of NFTs? Yeah, so of course I know that it's uh, maybe like it's of course it has impact on um, ecology, but uh, I've heard, I've read the statistic um, that it actually has like 0.8% of all like pollution or something so like if you see it in like in huge general bubble then it's not so huge but i see that so many platforms are trying to change that and they like make their new like new technologies to make it less polluted and yeah. like better for ecology yeah what, so it's what, nice to one, see that one, one statistic i haven't seen i'm curious about maybe you know is um you know, how much um, power do NFTs consume compared to how much power is consumed by cryptocurrency transactions, which are very similar 
in the amount of kind of computer crunching that has to go on. I suspect cryptocurrency is huge in comparison to NFTs, but I could be wrong. Yeah, you know, I I actually don't know that, you know, like deep, deep information, but I think you're also right that NFT is less uh, um, like ener energy, how you how you say that, like it takes less energy, but I can be also wrong. So I should, I should definitely check that. I, I don't know. You know, I'm like artist, so I'm focused on art. And yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I know the environmental thing is is the main thing that's kept me away from it, because I've been interested in cryptocurrency and and the whole blockchain and the idea for years. As anyone who's oh, listened cool. to the podcast will have heard me say, I bought two I bought two Bitcoin in 2011, <laughs> and I can't remember where I put and them. And you sold it? No, I can't remember no where way. I put them. <laughs> Damn it! <I'm> still, God. <laughs> yeah, I have Did the computer. You hear about that I have the smartphone. Yes. Um, I'm pretty yeah. sure I printed out the paper wallet, but I and I put it somewhere safe. You know that place? Oh, I put it yeah, I know safe. that. <laughs> yeah. Do you know that story about the guy from Switzerland? He's like looking for his uh, seed phrase for 10 years and he did some job and someone paid him like thousands of uh, bitcoins or so. And he put it on cold wallet, like that ledger wallet. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah, and he wrote somewhere his seed phrase and he like lost it or he doesn't know where it is anymore. And for 10 years, he's now like depressed. He's going to therapies because he just can't. Yeah, you know, yeah. Can you imagine that tension every, every day? Like you think you can be a millionaire, <laughs> but you can't because you forgot that stupid words. Particularly last year when um, Bitcoin like hit its high, high point. <laughs> Poor fella. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I've got a mild version of that. <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the that was the environmental thing was the thing that's kept me out of NFTs. But it seems like they're sort of turning the ship, and it's going yeah. much more environmental, which is kind of the way with technology. Is like, um, you know, you sort of it yeah, like remember off, the cars. Cars uh, at the beginning, like cars were absolutely a disaster with all that pollution. But then somehow, like they made it like less and less and less. So yeah. I think here is the same story. Just need some time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you choose your platform. Then how do you actually make your NFT? Do you just take a picture? Okay. Um, yeah. So I usually yes, I usually take a picture. First, I need to say that I'm painting that, and for last like half year, I paint specifically for NFT and um, like uh, it, it's divided now, you know, like I paint for NFT and I paint for physical like gallery. And for NFT, I paint like oil paint paintings. It's not a big format because I need to make a good quality photo of it. Um, I make a photo with, I have uh, like a camera, good camera, like black magic. And I make a photo of it in high resolution, like in high quality. And on Photoshop or like any other program, After Effects, sometimes if I want to add some animation to it, uh, or uh, Photoshop, if I want just to make, you know, situation a bit more, because, you know, like yeah. it looks better when it's brighter and more contrast in this uh, piece. Yeah, and then I just make PNG format if it's a static picture and MP mp4 if it's like animation yeah and i go to platform where i want to uh just go back a second it. Do, do you yeah. include any process images or information in the background like like that you mean like do i it, post about that no no as part i've heard some artists they they include process uh, images not necessarily in the what you can see of the nft but the info is there for the owner that they can um pull it up if they want yeah um i like in description i write usually like what was medium what was size of original work because sometimes like i i sell nft plus physical as i sell and um, then it's like necessary so the collector can see, okay, I'm buying NFT, but then there is also a painting that is, for example, 40 on 40 centimeters and, you know, like can buy that together. 
And then price is a little bit higher because it goes with physical. Um, yeah, so the photo or like animation, I swap it uh, on platform I choose and I have different platforms for different uh, NFTs. For example, on foundation, I have like collection and that called uh, Decentralized Renaissance. And it's about like, you know, like Renaissance. Uh, I have a portrait, first collection called The House of Medici. And it's a portrait of Medici family, but with crypto symbols and crypto like memes, you know, like, so it's kind of yep. like funny collection. Um, and uh, it also has like, you know, like some uh, very legendary uh, NFTs in it, or I don't like um, Giuliano Lorenzo sitting and then his face, uh, you know, like with magic makes uh, look him like a pepper. That's a green frog. That's yeah, one yeah. of the first NFT, like something like that. So it's yeah. kind of like irony, it's memes, you know, like funny yeah. collection. Yeah, but on another like non origin, I, I put put uh, on the NFT plus physical works on object. I put like sketches and etudes, you know, so I divide platforms into like uh, style or um, like genre or something like uh, yeah. So, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And then I swept the NFT and waiting for bids. <laughs> what did you say you sweep the NFT? Swap, like swap, you say swap. Swap, how do you spell that? I haven't heard that one before. S-W-A-P, swap. Swap. Oh, well, you swap. see, I'm saying that wrong. I, I said I that, that in Russian, then, Russian accent. S-W-A-P, swap, yeah, I think that's swap. Swap, swap, okay. Swap. How did you say swap? Yeah, uh, swap. Swap, yeah, I could be saying it wrong now. Um, no, okay, I'm, so I'm sure the process of turning your um, your MP4 or your .png into an NFT is part of the right. uploading process, yeah? Right, yeah. Like you make a stat contract when you upload your like painting or yeah. anything, like a file, yeah. and you create that token. Yeah, and that's where you pay the gas. That's where the gas gets paid for that process. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And on foundation, for example, you need to pay twice because first you need to download your work and, and like kind of mint, it's called mint the work. Yeah. And second time you list it. So you pay, so that painting goes to blockchain. I don't yeah. know, but foundation has the double, double payment. Um, yeah. So it's like, I think it, a, a bit expensive sometimes when gas is high, for example, during the day, especially if uh, USA has a daytime, then gas is pretty high. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's lovely. You swap it or swipe it or whatever, <laughs> and then somebody <laughs> buys it, and then yeah. you get paid in whatever currency it happens to be you're using on that platform. And right. then you can turn that uh, cryptocurrency into cash at some point <laughs> yes that's right but um you know i'm i'm holding uh so i'm i'm that holder person yeah. so yeah. i'm not spending that for example if i can i can convert that into another for example bitcoin or something yes. so yeah so i'm, I'm holding i'm not spending <laughs> Are, do you use the proceeds? Is it kind of circular now? Like, are the proceeds, are you using that for gas and things, you know, the expenses of generating your NFTs? Uh, uh, again, again, I, I didn't understand that. Could you please? Well, um, like initially, you would have had to put some dollars or euros or whatever right. in to get the whole thing going. Now that you've sold yeah. some you and you're holding your... your uh, your currency your cryptocurrency which whatever it is ethereum or whatever which one it is yeah now yeah. when you're uploading a new uh, nft are you using that to pay for gas and the expenses of uploading it yeah yeah absolutely so you earn some money yeah. and then you just like keep that for next one for example and i i've noticed so many uh, artists do that big mistake and i did that too like when I saw that first painting, I, I told you, and you know, like I was so excited and adrenaline hit me in my head and I, I put 
on foundation another four paintings at the same time. So I almost spent that money I earned on putting that, you know, into foundation. And that was completely wrong. Never, never do that again. And yeah, so and then like it wasn't sold, you know, like it was there for a long time. And it's also yeah. bad for history because art, uh, collectors can see like when you yeah. put that. You saturated painting, your own market. <laughs> yes. So you always do like you put one, it's sold, then put another one. Don't repeat my mistakes and don't put everything like at the same time. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, and another thing, by the way, um, if I may say that it's collaboration. I know if you heard that, but in NFT space, like artists do collaborations a lot. Did you hear I about didn't. that? Something? I, I, no, I didn't. No. no. Okay. So um, I did like a couple, of, not a couple, like I did like 20s, I think, like collaborations with uh, different artists. And one was very interesting because it was like a Hollywood actor. And he's uh, writing the poems, again, poetic. And he's writing the poems. And um, we, so we take my oil painting, we add some, like I add some animation. He writes a poem inspired by this painting. And he records his voice. And we put his voice into that file and add some music. And then it's such a beautiful, you know, like, piece where art means poetry mm. and it's really beautiful like it's all you you see the painting it moves a little bit like slightly but you also can hear yeah. the story with beautiful voice so and yeah. he's british so it's like like originally so his voice is just amazing oh yeah he asked is that lawrence duncan i uh, lawrence fuller uh Lawrence yeah, he asked a question, I think, didn't he? Um, I know, yes, I know. He's yeah, a good yeah, supporter. Yeah. Uh, nice, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a big collector, if, ah, if someone's listening. <laughs> so um, there's a thing about the number of editions that you release as well, isn't there? Yes, it is. Like, you can put editions. Um, like, you... you uh, like take a picture and then you say it's a picture with like 20 copies and then of course price is going to be less because it's each copy like um sh because it's 20 copies it's not like one unique piece but each copy has different code so it's actually like different uh different nft yes. so yeah but it's easier to sell, for example, sometimes because editions are more and then price is less. So it's also nice, like ni nice strategy, you know? So what do you generally do? What's your, how many editions do you do now? Um, on all platforms, I do one on one. So it's like unique piece, uh, but one, on one Tezos. Edition, yeah. Yeah, but on Tezos, I do like around 20 editions and okay. price is less. But yeah. that is like kind of um, like platform is like this. Like you, you buy for less money, but you buy more editions. So at the end, it's actually like, you know, like totally is very nice amount at the end. Yeah. And more people can afford art. Yeah. So it's really nice. Yeah. So. Yeah. Since you started, how many NFTs have you sold? Or oh, how many have you created and how many have you sold? Okay. So I almost sold everything I created, I should say. Um, right. I think around, ooh, I have maybe around like hundreds, 100 or right. something, like maybe 80 to 100. Okay. And how much does that equate to in dollars? You mean one NFT or like? No, like of all the NF of the hundred that you've sold, how much money have you made from that? Oh, it's dangerous to say like that. Nobody says such information online. <laughs> I ask everybody this kind of stuff <laughs> because I'll tell you why I'm asking. But not about right? NFT. Okay, well, I'm telling you why I'm asking you is because um, there's a whole school of thought that's like, yeah, in five years, NFTs won't be around. And like we'll have all, everyone will have learned all this new stuff and it just disappeared, you know, just like okay. MySpace or, you know, it'll just be, go that way. 
I'm not saying it will, but there's a concern about that. So um, okay. I'm asking on behalf of everyone listening, going, is it worth my while? Is Do you actually make any money from this? Or is it just a lot of whole new skill set? I mean, God, I've spent 20 years figuring out how to be a painter. And now I have to figure out <laughs> crypto bloody currency on top of everything else and NFT, you know. So it's like, that's why I'm asking you, like, you've gone through it. You've blazed a trail for us all there. Have you made any money from it? Is it worth it? Yes, yes, I, I think it, it is actually like, especially for artists, it's just another tool, you know, like to earn money and pretty doing like not so many things, especially if you have a lot of paintings and you can use it or you have a lot of sketches that are, you know, like in your room somewhere and nobody is buying that. Why not to use it and make some like money? I mean, like after all, if this tool will be this, it will be disappeared in five years, why not to use that five years to you know like earn something yes. and to yeah. find yeah. new collectors? And after all, you know, like I've noticed some collectors, NFT collectors, um, they bought NFT from me, but then they connected me and like uh, bought some physical paintings from me. Yes. So it's you know like it opens a new perspective. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I think it's just need to um, use that. Let me ask you in a different way then. Have you okay. made as much <laughs> money from <laughs> from your NFT sales as you have from your physical sales in the same time period? Okay, I should say like maybe five times more. Like if you say um, in one month, for example, you sell physical or you sell NFT, I think five times or 10 times more than if I sell physical. That's that's what we wanted to hear. <laughs> all okay. right, we're all going to go it. and do it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I yeah. mean, like, it's really, I, I, I suggest all my art fellows, I really suggest to yeah. to start that. I know it sounds like a little bit difficult the first time, you know, like I, all, I was also in that situation, but then yes. it's all just, you know, like. Yeah, as soon as I heard about it, because I kind of had this history with cryptocurrency anyway, I kind of like I understand the blockchain, I understood all of that kind of thing. And as soon as I heard of it, it just immediately slotted in in my head to, you know, artists can sell their physical painting, they can do uh, what a lot of artists do is limited edition print runs of their painting of their right. paintings. Or they can do an NFT of their painting. It's just like another right. thing. And each one, it, like it, to me, it's very close to a limited edition print. Or if you're just doing a one-off NFT, it's like you're doing one print. <laughs> it just happens to be a digital That's print. That's true. Um, of yeah, it. And it just yeah. fit, fits in in with that. Or, if, you know, if they wanted to do a coffee table book, that's another stream of income. It's like NFTs just fit in with that. Is that fair enough, do you think? Is that a, a reasonable assessment? Yeah. I think so, yes. And I think it will just, like, as you said, maybe it will disappear in five years. But I think it will not disappear, but it will be not that same, you know, like NFT, how yeah. it is right now. Change, it will be yeah. like, yeah, it will change a little bit. It will, yeah. maybe it will combine with traditional art galleries, with art shows, something like that. Yeah. But technology yeah. is going to be there because it's pretty good technology. It will be just set, you know, if it will be not there. Because, you know, decentralized, you know, it's all in, in code. You can't delete it. You can't fake that. You know, all the advantages. Yeah. So I think yeah. it will be there. For sure. I mean, I've been hearing people saying that about Bitcoin since I first heard about Bitcoin. It was like, oh, it's a fad. It'll pass. And, you know, it hasn't and it won't as far as I can see. But, yeah. Yeah, okay, absolutely. so when are you doing your course on how to do NFTs <laughs> for figurative artists? <laughs> Everyone wants to know. <laughs> you know, it's funny, but I, I do have some spaces actually, and it's it's actually nowadays in Russian language because I try to explain like my friends and people from traditional art world um, who want to start NFT, but for example, had. Uh, problems with English language because it's everything there is in English like you know you can't do anything without English you can use Google Translate or something like that but you still have to have English to communicate with people yes. and 
yeah, I do such spaces for like Russian audience to explain them what NFTs. And on Twitter, I almost every day have spaces with artists, collectors. We're talking about that. We're answering questions. Yeah, so I'm kind of like ambassador of NFT in traditional world. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to help I didn't, I didn't even know about any of that stuff. Questions. Say that again. Really? It's, no, yeah, I mean I like know. if... <laughs> connection <laughs> you go okay you say <laughs> <laughs> okay so i just said that um just you know like i'm i'm happy to help really like i have every day I get so many messages asking questions about nft how to start this that and that's actually i was surprised but to see that nft community is so supportive i was really surprised how people help each other and you know like help with answering stupid questions you know explain how this work how that works but they're really very supportive i never saw that in any other community actually you know like mm. and a collaboration for example did you see in traditional art world that artists collaborate with each other so often and then not, it's not like, so often it does happen but not so often yeah it happens yeah. but very seldom yeah 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 in fact i'm seeing it more now but it's coming from you know, like YouTube collaborations or uh, Instagram collaborations. It's it seems to be part of that side of things. It's coming that way rather than from the kind of the more traditional ways that artists interact with each other. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm really surprised, but like in good way. And I've noticed so many big, uh, and I've noticed so many traditional galleries. I've heard them in spaces talking that they want to, you know, like move into NFT um, like world, and they want to combine NFT with traditional art. Like uh, first, firstdeeps.com, uh, like the big platform that sells antique and art and everything. Did you hear about them? First Deeps. Uh, so they sell like like expensive art and antique and they have even nft they're on twitter with nft and they sell nft as well so there are many galleries going into that nft and i think it's nice just to use that tool as a tool not like you know um like you know just as a tool it's very nice and would be pity not to use that yeah 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 okay um Adrian Santos on Instagram says, I love that your paintings are modern, yet still do justice to realistic form. What did it look like when you decided you wanted to make a commitment to painting? How did you improve your technique and how many hours would you paint in a day? What is it like? How many hours would I pay or do I pay? Either, I think. It says would you paint, <laughs> okay. but... Yeah, in my dreams, I would paint all days, you know, like, but uh, yeah, but uh, I, I told already that I paint like half of the day. Uh, and um, about traditional, so yeah, of course, like I have something from traditional because I was, you know, uh, learning from all that copies, doing copies from old masters and, you know, studying their paintings. So of course, I have something from them because that's actually my art school, if you can say that. Yeah. And yeah, still trying to, you know, capture the modern man and the, you know, contemporary people around me with their feelings and um, how they look like. So that's why I think I combine something like traditional and at the same time um, capturing modern life and like fashion a little bit and yeah my sub my my subjects are usually like people from the crowd like people from the street uh with their stories and um yeah and i've noticed also that uh how i paint also it depends on surface because as i told you i tried that surface smooth and i noticed that my my colors were subdued a bit like tones were subdu subdued oh, okay. and it's funny because yeah because i i've noticed if it, the surface is smooth i'm painting a bit like relaxed you know like a little bit still but when surface is like with texture i start all that crazy uh, expressive brush strokes uh, yeah okay. mm. yes 
uh, did I answer some of <laughs> the parts of the question? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh God, my memory. I should do something with that. It's like a golden fish, you know, like in thirty <laughs> seconds memory. A golden fish. <laughs> it's pretty. <brilliant. laughs> um, it sounds like that your um, your work with your husband. It sounds like you. You know, you could probably paint all like all time and become like fully professional it sounds like you're not um doing that not because not for financial reasons maybe you are i don't know but it sounds like you're like a tight little unit and if you sort of jump ship on your husband you know you'd sort of leave him a bit stuck is that right um, yeah so you know it's like our company like it's our business so um like we're two and of course if if i just stop uh, working then it's going to be like some troubles <laughs> um yeah but i you know like i've noticed that um every month like i'm my husband helping me more and more with like giving me more and more time to paint because he's noticing that i'm like having more uh success in this uh like yes. in art and with nft i start like earning a bit more and then it also shows that I can do something myself and that brings also money so we can live, you know, like, yeah. So yeah, I can't complain because he helps me really a lot and he sees if I like do that and it brings something and I'm, you know, getting like more into that. So he helps me with time and giving me some like more time and taking some work for him and working like more, you know, he's a good husband. <laughs> good and my best friend so <laughs> yeah even better um robbie on twitter says do you think digital painting will replace will, will replace classic painting oh tough one ah um i i don't think because i think still like humans are humans and they love to touch and they love that tactile tactile how, how you said tactile yeah feelings? tactile yeah yeah, so I don't think like we will change that way, you know, like we're going everyone to metaverse and, you know, like just in virtual world. I don't think we're going to that. And like in that cartoon, you remember like uh, Valley or how it was? Um, I don't think we're going to that stage. I think like traditional art is always going to be here and we'll always want to have something on our walls and something to touch something to observe and you know like to uh like aesthetics to see um mm -hmm. i would you know like it's another uh, scene that i would recommend traditional artists and actually i beg them to go into nft because in nft there are so many digital art so many you know like generative art that just made pressing on you know button on computer you know like just yes and i really beg uh, traditional artists to go there and give that balance and bring yes. that art world into harmony because if we won't go there you know it will be completely digital and it will be so much not beautiful thing there so many not beautiful scene there so i really want that you know traditional um, artists will go there mm, i meant to ask you um what how does it work for a collector of nfts like how you know like if someone is a collector of paintings it's obviously unless they're mega rich and they put them in a free port, they're going to put them on their walls yeah. somewhere. Um, uh, but what, how does it work with an NFT for a collector? You mean like, how do they like hold it or display do, it? Right. Yeah. Display it. I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, or, for example, or does it, does it apply? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for example, I met a nice couple from Australia and they are both uh, NFT collectors. And they told me that they have, at home, they have screens that actually like they can change the NFT and it's kind of like painting you, you hang on the wall, but they have screens. Yes. And it's, yeah. yeah, it's even looks cool because you know, like painting is moving, for example, right? So yeah. you have something yes. on your wall that is moving. So, yeah, okay. yeah, some hold it. Some just resale it, like flip them, and some just, you know, like enjoying the aesthetics and the beauty of the piece yep. on the screens. Okay. Yep. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. What I was going to say about digital painting, 
Because I've noticed right? in the last, particularly in the last two years, I'm finding it harder and harder to tell the difference um, between, uh, like if I see a painting that I like on Instagram or something like that, um, and even with certain photographers as well, you know, but they'll use filters and certain things. And if it looks a bit like a painting, I have to really zoom in very close to be able to tell, oh, no, that was actually done digitally. And sometimes I can't tell. I can't actually tell. I can only tell when I go to the person's profile and they go, oh, you know, um, digital artist or something like that. So yeah. I think um, in terms of the the beauty and the compelling nature of a painting that you know, I mean, yeah, it's lovely to see a painting in person. And if you can see it, of course, and as you, you know, you just drove a couple of hours to see a painting in person, that's never going to change. But um, the, the, the world that we all live in is that the majority of art that we see is on a screen. So um, I think uh, the beauty of a traditionally painted painting, um, I think if you like that, you are still going to like it regardless of whether it's done digitally or not. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. No, I absolutely agree. And even I try to paint on iPad, like in Procreate, but I still like, I still can't, uh, can't use that brushes that, you know, like do like oil paint paints, but still I can feel that sound you know like when i touch brush uh, when brush touches the wood and that feeling in your hand so for me it's still like difficult to change i that's why i think i i'm not going to paint like with oils or with color on ipad um but you you're right like i have some some friends uh, uh artists that they paint and they paint like so beautifully but I also didn't know that they painted on iPad. Uh, I was really surprised when I also yeah. zoomed that. Yeah, it's just, I was really shocked that you can actually do that. And I was asking immediately, like what brush set you use? Because, you know, it looked like so real, you know? Yeah. And to try that. But even after I tried that, I, I didn't have that feeling. And you remember, I told you I'm a touchy, touchy person. I need to touch you. So. <laughs> touchy, touchy. Um, I think then, though, what's going to happen in the future is that it won't be down to the viewer or the consumer of the painting as to whether it's done digitally or physically. It'll be down to the artist of whether they like the tactile quality and whether they like to work yeah. physically or, no, I like to work digitally. I, I have a feeling that's where it's going to go. Yeah. And, you know, I had actually, I had a little protest, uh, like I was against the digital art one day and I created an NFT that was very funny because I created an NFT that called a segment of art. And what I did, so I painted very, like with very bold brush strokes, like really, you know, it was you know, five millimeters so thick. And I painted that and then I did like um, like 3D scanner, you know, like when you scan it with all that volume and all that things. And I made NFT. So it was like a very close, close uh, detail of that painting, like somewhere like half of the eye, you know, like a little mm. painting of that, a little detail of that painting, like zoomed, I don't know, a hundred times uh, more. And I, um, I, I uh, put it on foundation and I sold that NFT with physical. And my protest was in that, that you can't do these brush strokes with uh, digital brushes. You know, that yes. I wanted to show that look inside the painting, look how beautifully colors are mixing with each other. Look how beautiful volume you have when you like paint with real brush and real oils, you know, like that was my kind of my protest, I remember, and it was pretty successful. Like it was sold immediately. And I remember the collector got it like the physical and he, he could see the physical piece and he could find that segment of that uh, oil painting and see that beauty of all that, you know, like sick brush strokes yes. and colors and shadows. Yeah, so that was my protest once. 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's nice. And it's, as you say, you possibly sold a painting to somebody who wouldn't have bought a painting normally, you know, like the NFT was the way in for that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I just wanted to show that, you know, like guys, you can't do that with digital brush, you know, but now I'm not that (laughs) aggressive anymore. (laughs) I love everything now. um alex perez montero on twitter says who's your favorite latin american artist oh i should now remember um i think nicolas uribe is really cool he is he he was on your podcast and i think even twice right um well he was on for his own episode which was six hours long and oh, he God. <laughs> was on for yeah i think he was back on he's come he's helped me with some uh spanish translations on uh-huh. with them um, when aranthasu martinez was on and i think some he was on for something else as well but yeah he's been on a few times yeah he's cool and i mean like he's a media superstar like what he's doing on his youtube channel and all that videos He's, I think, like a really, um, like artist that we can absolutely uh, take some advices from him, and yes. how he, you know, like shows himself, show his art, how he talks. Yeah. It's everything so interesting, and yeah, very inspiring person. And I think a cool yes. guy too. Yes. And I also know Caesar Santos uh, because I was at his workshop. And he's also a nice guy. Like, it was really fun to be with him in Florence. And we did sketches uh, sitting on the streets in Florence from David. Um, So it was really cool. Yeah. Very good. (laughs) Um, What's the last piece of art you bought? Oh, okay. I wrote that. So the, uh, even because I know I will forget uh, the name. So it was actually NFT. Now I can say that because, you know, I explained what NFT is. And it was oil painting anyway. And I think it was like 20 editions of oil painting transfiguration by Andreas uh, Bures or Byrus. I think I'm... Because, you know, in Twitter, everyone know, everyone has uh, nicknames. So you, when you yeah. see the real name, you never know how to read that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I bought yeah. that painting. Okay, very good. Yeah. yeah, you 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 don't have a nickname. Um, neither do I on no. Twitter. I I was yeah. I started on Twitter when it started. Pretty much, it was like the first social media thing. Um, so I I'm I not couldn't verified, find you though. on Twitter actually. Yeah, it's really hard. It's John Dalton. <laughs> no, really, I I, I, I yes. it's what I wrote. I didn't find you. Well, I'm I'm I haven't been very active. <laughs> but um, oh, okay yeah algorithm is like that yeah it's the twitter bit is john underscore dalton if you're looking for me um, okay but yeah i've been yeah god what well, since when did twitter start it was you know i I'll tell you how long ago i was on twitter right when i started on twitter um the only way you could put something on twitter um if you weren't sitting in front of your laptop was you had a number that you texted into and you could only put 140 characters on so you'd be like you'd send it you text and it would go through to twitter and it would show up on your feed no when it was yeah, yeah. like i don't know <laughs> like two <laughs> 200 years ago <laughs> yes it was 200 years ago um, no I, I know that was bad <laughs> It feels like that now. I think about it, but yeah, like I think I, it was like that for a first year. I was on Twitter. It was all text based, and then um, and that was even with an iPhone. It wasn't like oh well, it was before the iPhone, but okay. I think that would have been two thousand and seven or eight or something like that. Like wow. It, okay. Yeah. No, that yeah, time yeah. I even didn't know what Twitter is. I didn't know what Instagram. I think there was no Instagram that time. There was no Instagram. No, no, no. Twitter no, was the first. It was Facebook. Twitter was, maybe. No, Twitter was before Facebook for me anyway. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like I was using Twitter um, for a good while before um, Facebook came along because Facebook, there was MySpace. <laughs> it's that game talking about history. Yeah, MySpace. There was right. MySpace yeah. and like everybody was nuts about MySpace. Then in Ireland, there was a thing called Bebo. I don't know how big <laughs> that was everywhere else. That was before Facebook and everybody was on Bebo. 
because um, I came back to Ireland in 2006 from Australia and everybody was on Bebo. And I was like, what is this <laughs> Bebo thing? <laughs> and Bebo. then Facebook slowly took over in you know the, f- the following kind of three or four years till it became the big thing. Did you notice they call it, uh, themselves Meta now? Like, I did. I, I've got some mails from them, and it was not not Facebook anymore. It was like you have some mail from Meta, and I was like, "What's that?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same on Instagram. If you look at the bottom of Instagram, it says Meta now as well. Yeah, they have Meta. Yeah, hmm. it's another did... sign that they're moving into Metaverse, maybe because they call well, they're, themselves they're, Meta. <laughs> they're trying to, but they just recently lost. 260 something or other uh, billion Ouch. dollars off their stock price did you see that yeah i i was thinking that changing the name was going to be painful for them and <laughs> i didn't know that that much but okay wow yeah it's the big i mean i don't follow the stock market at all but i just saw it come up on the somewhere it's the it was the biggest loss of value in a company in the history of the stock exchange wow. it wasn't just about the metaverse it's that basically people are leaving facebook um yeah you know it's kind of it's reached saturation they've kind of gone they've been sort of limping along in um developing countries for the last year or two and uh, but even that's getting saturated now and it's become Absolutely. with with the younger people it's it's kind of considered the old fogies kind of platform and they're all on TikTok absolutely yeah different places you know I'm yeah delighted. The new I, don't, I, think it's, <laughs> I, I haven't liked it for a long time something kind of corrupt about <laughs> it right you're on a desert island no one else is there no one else is coming you've got food you've got shelter that's all taken care of and you have art materials would you still make art even if no one was ever going to see it Oh, yes, of course. I actually thought the question was about, you know, like you don't have food, you don't have shelter, you have to do everything yourself and hunt and everything. And then are you going to do art? No, no. But it's it's even easier to choose. No, it's easier to choose. Of course, I will do because I just, you know, like need beauty around me or something that, you know, like I can express. I will paint on on stones for sure with some pigments that I will find uh, I don't know in jungles or maybe I can paint on someone's skin like snake or something like I think I will find some <laughs> way to paint Jesus good luck or maybe with, that. On, <laughs> <laughs> with blood you know like uh, ooh, I was going to look spooky <laughs> yeah but definitely I'm going definitely okay. to do art just for myself yeah all right good you if how the... about you did you answer um... that question before no, I haven't been asked. Would I? Um, I'm not sure if I would <laughs> paint. I probably would paint, but I'd probably make sculptures. I'd make inventions. Yes. Um, the, the, <laughs> the funniest Ceramics. thing I heard was somebody was saying I'd make a big sculpture that said "Help from the air." You know, <laughs> 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 rescue SOS. me. Yeah, I don't know if I'd do that, but uh, yeah, I think I would. Um, yeah, I would definitely. I, I mean, I do it anyway, like you do. You just yeah, you just part, part you of your just nature. need just to do that. Out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, of course, I will. Um, if there was one underlying theme to all your work, what do you think it would be? Underline what? Sorry. Theme. Theme. Okay. Um, humans. Is it a theme? Is it like? Can I answer with human? <laughs> no. Like a, no, that's not a theme. No. <laughs> That's a subject. Okay. Um, portraits? Is it, a, is it this? We no, can, theme, we can play themes that are game like, for a long time. Themes would be more like freedom, sorrow, uh, okay. self-expression, yeah, um, lightness, the um, poetry. Okay. <laughs> poetry. Yes, poetry is my word. <laughs> mm, yeah, maybe something like kind of uh, like uh weird love or maybe like like did you say weird love you know yes i mean like not that love when you see people kissing happily you know but that weird emotional stage when you you know like you desire to be with each other but for example you can't you know like that drama yes yeah like kafka's love you know that kind of love i think it's that's what i was getting at with the four people thing 
you know, you have two people together, but then there's the two other people that they're not with or that they've left or that, you know. Yes. No, I would think about that. That's a really cool idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and then weird love. Going to the paintings of crowds. <laughs> weird love. Yes, weird love. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> um weird so you you've mentioned galleries what's your experience been of the art business um side of things some people have great stories love stories some people have horror stories how's it gone for you oh it was everything was really like good i had really luck to i was lucky enough i mean like with all galleries um i really love work with american galleries i should say maybe a bit more than with european because they have a little bit easier way to communicate and you know like the way they chat with you the way they uh, solve the problems or you know like talk with you it's a bit like easier you feel yeah. like you talk with friend or something like that um and I like that kind of communication. Like I worked with German gallery, but it was so strange. Maybe I was not just lucky enough to, it was a little gallery, so maybe that's why. But it was so strange, like everything was so official. Like, you know, each letter was so official. It was so boring because <laughs> it started with very official words. It ended with very official words, although we just, you know, we we met, we talked. It was everything was so cool. But why so official? Like, you know, we are artists. We should be a little bit relaxed, especially with you know each other, because we're like one big family or something. Yes. And I really like that way how American uh, galleries talk with you and like how they communicate. Although one art gallery that I have like in Netherlands, there are two uh, handsome men there, and like uh, I love to talk with them. They're very like. <laughs> Did you, you know, say like, two handsome in... men? Yes, I mean like they're handsome. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fact. <laughs> I can't do anything without that. Yeah, no. So it's David lovely. and Renee, yeah. they're also cool. Yeah, they're also cool. I'm very lucky to be with them too. Yes, and Arcadia and is very nice. I love. Did you to say be that's the them. Netherlands? The two handsome men are. In? Yeah, in Netherlands. Yeah. Okay. Yes, in Netherlands. And Arcadia in Amer in America. Yeah, in New York. You, right. Like, look, they're probably listening. You better say they're handsome as well, or you know. Oh yes, of course he was, <laughs> he was handsome. Ooh, oh God. <laughs> but, you know, I I I. I saw him only on videos, like uh, when it was LA art show and one friend of mine, he went to that LA art show and made a video for me, you know, like oh, with yeah. all my paintings because I couldn't go there because of COVID. And yeah, but I saw him only on video, but I'm sure he's handsome when I will meet him in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I think you're covered there now. Um, I hope so. <laughs> what sort of price range are your paintings selling for at the moment? Um, I think from like around uh, thousand to seven thousand, something like that, six seven thousand. Like right, that... I'm not so because I'm a young artist, so I'm not that. Like Denis Sarajan told the prices. Wow. <laughs> Say that again. Uh, no, I just like remembering like what uh, cool artist said uh, answering that question in your podcast and they had like big prices like it was wow god i hope my my oh, yeah. paintings who, who did, sell in did you say prices. it was dennis dennis sam sarazen like he was saying also his uh paintings are pretty expensive but because he's yes wow he's cool yeah, he's yeah. cool yeah. um okay and that's dollars uh us dollars seven thousand is the top price yeah, something like that. I think it's what stays in in gallery uh, website. So yeah. I just can okay. try that. Do you have a big art dream you'd like to achieve before you die? <laughs> it was it was so like sad when you said like before you die. You know, like so, yeah. So I'm looking at my watch here. <laughs> before you die. Well, what, how else do you yeah. say it? I know it's a bit macabre, but you know what I mean? Before the end of your life, your long, beautiful life. How about that? Okay, okay. Very long, please. Um, oh, yes, I, I would love to have my own studio, like the big one, you know, where I can paint big paintings. 
And because I always wanted to paint big paintings, like two, three meters. And I never could do that because um, my studio is very small. And I maximum what I can do is like around one meter, something. Um, otherwise, I can't stand behind, you know, to see the painting. Uh, and it will just not suit into my uh, space. Uh, so, yes, big, big with a lot of light, big studio. Uh, yes, like I think that. And full-time artist, being full-time artist. Okay. Yeah, yes. might sound sounds like both of them are very close. <laughs> uh, I hope so. <laughs> One day. It, it's, yeah. you know, like always very expensive to take uh, the studio, as I've, like, as I've heard from artists. It's always like a bit expensive. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, <laughs> last question. If there's okay. one thing you, if there's one thing you could pass on to future generations, what would it be? Um, you know, I wrote that down, like some of my thoughts, but it's so dark here, I can't even see what I wrote. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I remember I was thinking something about like um, I would say like balance in everything uh, to find a balance in everything. I mean, like. Um, don't say no to like new technologies of future, like combine it with past and don't say no to like past, use that experience in the future. You know, like always have a balance between past and future, between like, um, actually between everything in your life, just find the balance. And I think that's the key to happiness and key to like your mental health, happiness and your soul happiness. Yeah, so I would say like find a balance in everything you do. Very good. Is it poetic enough? <laughs> poetic enough. Uh, well, enough. it's very practical and it is somewhat poetic, yes. Um, but yeah, very useful and very good and lovely in its own way. Yeah, <laughs> Thank balance. You. Yeah. Thank you. You're so kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not just you. I'm kind to everybody. <laughs> Yes, I know. I know. It's not That's true. Okay. I'm not special. I'm not that special. <laughs> well, everyone's special. Um, okay. So look, it's been lovely chatting with you. Um, I really like your paintings and Thank um you so much. it's I I was so surprised to um see that you were predominantly self taught. Um I think the f the fact that you didn't go through you know, what I was joking about, years and years of um, a rigorous Russian uh, <laughs> academy training. <laughs> um, I think that that really highlights your talent. Like you're just naturally talented. Um, and it's like, it, like, as I said, the fact that you haven't, you haven't had that kind of rigorous training because the way you paint looks like you did have that kind of rigorous painting because your expression of anatomy, expression, all that stuff is so on point and so good. Thank you. So and much. then you've just made all these fantastic intuitive leaps, you know, right from the um, the the uh, substrate, you know, the wood that you use, and just you know, for someone listening, I <laughs> Tanya is not the only person who paints on that substrate i've seen other artists paint on that substrate and it is not a silver bullet it's not easy and it's not easy to get it right um and the like what what you're doing and what you've done with it plus your choice of color i mean your color choices and the way uh you combine them because nobody asked you about it but you know it's not just like oh that's an interesting color for your background it's like why did you make that hand red you know, why did you make that, you know, or whatever? It's 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 not just uh, the kind of, you know, the standard color choices that, you know, you're making very um, lovely intuitive leaps with that as well. Your eye for color and your eye Thank for you. form. Fantastic. And you are one of those artists who... I find really encouraging um, f because you kind of are moving what figurative art can be forward because you've got a very unique way of working. 
you've got a very unique, uh, your paintings are very unique and distinctive and they kind of open up possibilities because it's very easy with people who are, uh, who are very uh, academically trained and it's almost like they're heading at great speed into the past. And I don't mean that in an, in an unkind way. I mean, they're, they're trying to be as good as Rembrandt. If I could just be as good, you know, if I could do one painting that was half as good as a Caravaggio, I could die a happy person. You know, it's that kind of uh, thing, which is very lovely. And if, you know, to see someone who's doing that and they get close to it, that's very inspiring. But it is kind of yeah. backward looking to me. Whereas your kind of painting, and there are other artists who are like that, it's like I find it there's a lot more energy in it because it's like the possibilities open up um, in a beautiful way. So I think that's, you know, when I came when I first saw your paintings, that's the kind of feeling I've had. It was like combinations of new things that I hadn't seen before and a freshness and a new possibilities on the horizon that I hadn't even thought of. So that is fantastic as well. Plus, it's been really um, nice to um, hear all about the way that you go about it, the your process, and how yeah, you're in, how intuitive you are with the whole process, and how it's just nice to see someone who follows their intuition and it works out really well. Because we can all have intuitive hunches. I've had many of them and they've often hit a brick wall. <laughs> they haven't <laughs> turned out to be a lovely idea at all. So it's lovely to sort of see how that your intuition is pointing you in very good directions. And Thank it's you. been nice to meet you and sort of see the person behind all that. And yeah, it's been very good to hear all about the NFTs as well. That's been very helpful. Um, and I think a lot of people will be, if, I think you've demystified that. Uh, quite well so yeah it's been lovely chatting yeah. with you thank you so much thank you so much I'm really like speechless and flattered that you actually invited me because you know like your podcast has such an incredible artist and I was just like I was shocked when you wrote me really I'm telling you honestly and I'm I'm like <laughs> no words to describe how happy I am to be here thank you so much for for like chatting with me it was really really cool and we laugh a lot <laughs> actually i was I, I thought it was going to be like serious talk but we had a lot of jokes that's cool i really feel very comfortable talking with you even oh, with my like english you know like problem is uh, another language is always like a little bit difficult to express yourself but you know you made it like easier even like you helped me a lot to yeah, not to feel that <laughs> Thank no, you. you did great. Thank God. you so much. You've got three languages. I mean, God, I haven't, I've got, I've really just got English, a little bit of Irish and bad language. That's the only, that's all I've got. <laughs> I just actually wanted to ask that Irish. I had a friend and he was trying to talk with me in Irish. Like <laughs> I didn't understand a word. <laughs> it was so yeah. funny. Yeah. It's yeah. a whole, it's a whole language unto itself. Um, and it, wow. <laughs> it sounds very sing-songy. I think it's got a very melodic kind of quality to it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I keep in touch with everybody. Uh, so I'm sure we'll keep in touch for Zoom tea and coffee or whatever. But yeah, we'll say goodbye for now. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. I've never bye. felt this good in my entire life. Make me some spaghetti. Actually, I'd prefer a cup of tea. A cup of tea would be lovely. So, yeah, just a little reminder, mainly because every second or third person who becomes a patron has got in touch with me and said, you know what, I've been listening to your podcast for ages and I didn't become a patron, not because I don't have the money, not because I don't think it's great, I just didn't get around to it. So this is a little friendly reminder that if you'd like to be a patron, you'd like to buy me a cup of tea, go to patreon.com forward slash John Dalton, gently does it, all one word, or follow the link in the show notes to become a patron. I would really appreciate it if you could do that, particularly if you've been meaning to and you just haven't got around to it. It would be great. It would mean a lot to me. All right. Thank you. Bye. We are the Argyle Pimps. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we 
bank. We are the Argal Pimps. So buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. We are the Argal Pimps. So buy us a drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argal Pimps. So buy us a drink.